wings report in. Red 10 standing by. Red 7 standing by. Red 3 standing by. Red 6 standing by. Red 9 standing by. Red 2 standing by. Red 11 standing by. Red 5 standing by. Red Fox standing by. For Red October standing by. Come on, you guys are supposed to do this with me. Jeez. <laughs> today's gonna be a really good show. We're getting back to nuts and bolts today. Got a lot of, got a lot of things. It's almost like Red Bull Popery once again. I feel like I have to go around the floor. In my Wednesday shows. Anyways, live from Reno, Nevada. This is the Rational Mail. It's from my secret bunker, middle of the Nevada desert. Fallout shelter. Don't worry, I'm well supplied. Well supplied. All my satellite uplinks are here. I apologize for doing this to you so early in the show, but looks like I'm going to have you guys make me do this. So I'm probably going to have to do this. Oh my! One of the things I see problematic in the so-called manosphere online, it's because all the men who are unsuccessful are clattering on about what's wrong with women. It's like, mm -hmm. by definition, there's nothing wrong with women, right? If you're not adapting yourself to women, it's not the women's problem. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's your problem. And that's by definition. And it's the same thing in relationship to your relationship to the world is that if your sacrifices aren't being rewarded, the right question to ask is, how am I prideful and blind? Not how is the world constituted in an ill-gotten manner? It's all your fault. Very important to note that if you are an emotionally unavailable man, and trust me, most likely if you are an emotionally unavailable you man, you're not going to be able to admit it yourself, but... If you're an emotionally unavailable man, you cannot create safety for the woman that you're with. Why? You're not there for her, so you're not trustworthy. Also, it will end in a woman feeling alone in her relationship. You will be signaling to that woman by being emotionally available that you are unsafe, and it is an absolute guarantee that relationship will end. Well, I'm a whore! <laughs> Term one night stand sequential relationship types. Okay, who are they? Psychopathic, narcissistic, Machiavellian, and sadistic. All one night stand people? The definition of a psychopath is someone who uses someone for short term gratification. So it's definitional. And then you might say, well, I'm not. You know, I'm not really sure that's the definition of psychopath. I mean, call me crazy. It's been a little while since I've seen the DSM, but I don't think that's actually the definition, Jordan. Like that, I just like sex. It's like. Yeah, but if you practice that for five years, you're not going to become what you practice. You remember the dreams that that you um you had you 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 could you do you you watch your boyfriend or husband stops being attracted to other women. He has there's he's, he's he's dying. Yeah. yeah, I don't get mad when my boyfriend like. Today I was li he's on a radio show and I was listening to his show yesterday. But he was talking about that. You remember that uh, the World Cup the Iranian like that really hot girl? Do yeah. I remember? I think about yeah, her every day. yeah. He mentioned something about her and I was like, it was he was re they were just reading tweets that they liked and it was some tweet about her like like we'll miss her and I could tell that yeah. he was like turned on by her and he didn't say it but he was like I could just tell like yeah. he sympathized with the tweet and I was just like. And it made me like so jealous because she looks nothing like me. Yeah. And I could tell that he like was definitely probably like zoomed in on a picture of her at one point. But man, it made me like so horny for him. I was yeah. just like, I miss you so much. I don't know. I like when yeah, I see him. But you've always him. kind of been like that, right? Yes. You like, you, right. You, but it's like uh... the threat. Like hey, I'm gonna lose him to that. So I gotta like, ah, oh, yes. And it makes me. I always just get mad when women are like, he's attracted to women. I saw him looking at a girl. It's like if no your boyfriend shit. or husband stops being attracted to other women. He has, there's, he's, he's, he's dying. Yeah. Flawless victory. What do you say about body count? The testament of your body count is more your rejection rate than how many people you slept with. Let's take somebody like you, for example, who's got a big name on social media, looks great, access to loads of women through the nightclub. Now, if you're. She's addressing Chris Williamson just for 
information. Your body count is, let's say if it's 10, but you've had hundreds of girls throwing themselves at you, yours is actually still low. Whereas if another guy who has no access to women, but finally gets one or two girls to sleep with him, on paper, it might be less, but his rejection rate is so low. So really look at how many people your partner is rejecting rather than just their body count. Because on paper, a really unattractive man who has nothing going for him, his body count's going to be low. Doesn't mean he's a decent man. It's just that he didn't have the opportunity. Similarly, women that are not that nice to be around, not that kind, not that pretty, not that attractive, hers is going to be low doesn't mean she's virtuous it's just that she didn't have access it's the ones that have access but choose to be selective that's what you should be looking at is their selectivity your mental health isn't dependent on you that's not the right way to think about it i don't think you can be mentally healthy in the absence of a long-term stable relationship you have to be married so you have to establish a relationship with someone that integrates sexuality that's there for the long run because there for the long run is the same as sane does he seem more angry to you? Like everything is like, I got that furrowed brow. And, there for tomorrow, there for the next minute. That's not sanity. That's impulsiveness. That's aimlessness. They're the same thing. Um, I disagree. You want to find a man, you better downgrade your look. And I was like, what? Right? He's like, when I look at you, I think what a gorgeous woman, but I can't have her because she's too expensive. And I was like, uh, yeah, that's the point. How dare you? <laughs> I'm not about to go downgrade my luck so I can get someone who's cheap or who can't afford me, right? I upgraded my look even more after he gave me this advice because I'm like, uh, no, thank you. I'm not trying to downgrade my look so someone can afford me easily. I'm trying to find the guy that can afford me, right? That can afford to be in the same room with me. I'm going up. Okay. So that's how it really works. The woman next to the man defines his status in society in subtle ways, often subconscious. Exactly. So if you are doing 50 50 with your man and you are, you know, giving him that, you're building him up while building yourself down. Like, it absolutely makes no sense. Well, I'm a whore. Yeah. Oh, it is like, pray about your stupidity. Here's a prayer that'll work for sure. You want to see if prayer works? Here's one. This will work. Sit on the edge of your bed. Ask yourself, what bloody stupid thing do I continue to do that's making my life more miserable than it has to be and everyone else's life around me that I could give up, that I would give up? You'll get an answer. It won't be when you want. That's how you'll know it's true. <laughs> but if you act on it, then your life will improve. And that's a proper prayer. She's not a Christian! I want you to feel the way that they feel, but at the beginning, we made it clear that that ain't what we are. crazy. The person who fell in love is definitely at fault. And the reason is, and all that. We, 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 gonna, we gonna keep it real up here today. We gonna keep it real up here today. Because at the end of the day, shh. People enjoy lying to themselves to keep somebody that I really like and I knew I liked right from the top of the relationship close to me. And that's the problem. You knew that if I kept a G and said, you know what, I really like you and I might fall for you, that that was going to push you away because that ain't what you wanted. So what am I going to say? I'm going to say, okay, you don't want a relationship? I don't either. And then hoping that's going to keep you close to me and hoping that eventually you're going to develop the same feelings I got. And then when that person who stand on their word that they said at the top of the relationship, I don't want to be with your You catching feelings has nothing to but do with that really person being right or wrong. You What gives you joy? You know, um, I think, I think uh, for me it was, uh, I've been trying to work it out. You know what I mean? Like, you know, we all, because, you know, the, we, one thing I definitely learned that uh, everything I thought made you happy, made you happy for a minute. Tell me you know, about it. You know what I mean? Tell so me about I, I, I read something a, a while back. I actually have it in when you came into the kitchen. It's written there because I need to. It says it says that uh, happiness is not a future event. Do you wow. know what I mean? Yeah, it's no, like that's it's beautiful. one of those things yeah. that everything that we're doing here, it's the True. hardest thing for any of us humans is to be present and right. enjoy this right yeah, now and yeah. be happy about what's this. Easier said than done because we always think like the, the, the platinum record when the dream we had is gonna do it. And then you still got issues. You got problems in personal. It doesn't change personal life. Yeah. It doesn't change any. Let me look at what happened with any band, the greatest bands in the world, the Van Halen's, everybody, everybody, Zepp. You could still all live your dreams, but you think those things aren't the things that, mm. those, are, those are things that you enjoy. 
But happiness has to be, you know, you have to just appreciate you have to be. You have to. Yeah, yeah. You have, you have to, to. You have to be blessed whatever with whatever we're doing now. That's Every, why I'm asking you guys. I'm looking. I'm still looking. Yeah. I, mean, I ask everybody. You're not going to find it. You're not going to find it. Yes, it's I being, am. It's being uh, present. Oh, you're, already, you're already happy, man. It's right here. How could you be happier than being sitting with us right now? Hi. It doesn't get any. Well, better. that's a little I'm overrated. <laughs> I'm happy. All right. All right. All right. There you go. Here's your quote for today. Thank you, Nuno. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing with me, Nuno. God, I love that guy. <sighs> Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And here we go right now. Howdy. <clears throat> Hi there. How you going? Pat Campbell. <sighs> Gotta remember those days. Anybody remember those days? No, you don't. Of course you don't. You just started following me yesterday, didn't you? Oh, man. What a, what a, what a, what a week it has been. Um, I want to get back to some old school stuff today. Yeah, Arthur C. Clarke. The uh, would you call him a futurist? I guess I would call him a kind of call him a futurist. Just kind of rushed into the studio today. Sorry about that. Um, I would I would call him a futurist. Certainly, the science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, the reason I use that today is because it's going to be kind of pertinent to what we're going to get into today. I want to talk about um, emotions, and I think that a lot of uh, a lot of the criticism that, you know, well, one of the criticisms, there's so many different criticisms. Everybody's like disingenuous to begin with when it comes to like, you know, well, those red pill guys, they don't talk about emotion. They don't talk about emotions. They think you should just be a, a robot. Mm, no, no, we don't. Um, actually, if you read any of my books, you would know. Yeah, hookers and blow. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, there you go. I'm going to I'm going to put that on there. Wait, 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 wait. Where'd that go? Hookers and blow. Hookers and blow. Thank you. Yep. You always get that on there. Yeah, I know. I know. Well, see, here's the thing is uh, let me let me explain why I use so many Jordan Peterson clips today, um, because he's kind of getting a little, you know, hostile in his old age, I guess. Uh, and I, I'm wondering if it's like if it's not playing to an audience at this point, but I'm going to dig into I have another video that uh, with uh, with Jordan and uh, Chris Williamson uh, today. And I will, I'll dig into that because it's pertinent to what we're talking about. Actually, the thing that sort of like uh, set me off on today's topic is uh, actually it was whole math <laughs> of all people. Uh, whole math was uh, I, I was been, you know, sort of sifting through some of his videos, which, by the way, please go subscribe to whole math. I think he's great. Uh, I'm really I think I might try to get him on this show. I definitely want to get the the uh, this new guy was it the naked developer or something like that. I think I used one of his clips recently. He was talking about how the algorithm works for dating uh, apps. Uh, he just reached out to me on Instagram. I'm going to see if I can set something up maybe for a midweek interview with him. Uh, I also would like to I'm trying to get a hold of uh, home math. I, I don't think it would be that difficult. I just go through Mike because I know Mike's interviewed him before. So I'll probably be doing that uh, later this week. I'm going to start doing a little bit more material because I am housebound because of my Greyhound, which is actually uh, Ned is actually doing much better. Thank you very much. Got to give you the, the Ned update first. Um, but I wanted to talk about um, uh, instinct, emotion and reason. This is a, uh, a, a concept that I sort of was developing uh, as far back as, oh gosh, what, 2017, 2018, I think, I wrote a series of essays on the Rational Mail, my blog at the time, and they turned into a kind of a an abridged version of uh, all of those sort of a condensed version, I guess, of all those essays. And they showed up in my, uh, my fourth book, uh, Religion. And I really don't know if I did justice to it because it's such a, it's a much broader um, concept, I think, than most people want to give it credit. And so there's there was like two two instances uh, this week that really sort of set me off on that on this path, and one of them was uh, reading a uh, a tweet by Chris Williamson of all, of all people talking once again about vulnerability. That old chestnut gets to get reheated again, and so that sort of set me off on this. And then I was wondering how many people are really aware of the triune brain theory and. Uh, so I wanted to get into that a little bit because it, I had no idea. By the way, I wrote an essay. I'm going to read a little bit of it to you today: uh, instinct, emotion, and reason. And this was this was kind of an extension of what I was doing uh, in psychology at the time when I was writing this stuff. And it occurred to me that there are really three different processes that human beings use when they're processing and sort of interpreting information through our ears, our eyes, our nose, our mouth. You know, the, the senses and um, 
that really breaks down into instinct, emotion, and reason. Now, I This was before I even had heard of the triune brain theory because triune brain theory was something that was sort of like put to the side or was like really kind of like uh, ignored. Uh, triune brain theory has been around really since I think the early 70s. And um, we didn't, I don't think we had enough, um, I don't think we had enough real understanding of like neurosciences and we certainly hadn't applied to the human genome by that point obviously and i think we have a better understanding of of how the brain works i'm not saying it's complete obviously but uh i think we have a better understanding of it and it seems to me that we need to real really kind of revisit triune brain theory um theory whatever it is um because it kind of i, I was i was kind of so i surprised i surprised myself I surprised myself because I had no idea what trying brain theory was when I was writing instinct, emotion, and reason. Uh, I was attempting at that time to sort of sort out the way that women process sort of their surroundings and their environments and, you know, through the filters of instinct, emotion, and reason. Whereas men, on the other hand, it's usually instinct, reason, and then emotion. But uh, we can also see how that process uh, sort of gets, um, let's just say, sidetracked a bit. And uh, another uh, reason I started wanting to sort of reheat this topic a little bit was because I think a lot of guys will run into uh, these practical problems with some woman that they're involved with. And that woman ends up uh, becoming very emotional or we, we tend to think of women sort of as, as hysterical or histrionic or um, they tend to be ruled by their emotions. They tend to be ruled by uh, like drama. I, I want a woman with no drama. Good fucking luck. <laughs> um, Drama and indignation are simply part of the female dynamic and how you deal with that or how you don't deal with that uh, is really, well, it's kind of up to you, I guess, but you're, it's something that you're going to have to at least untangle for yourself at some point as a man. So I wanted to get into that a little bit more today. Uh, there's a lot of, I mean, I could probably do another like four hour show on, on just like this, just this topic. But uh, when I was writing the, um, the title to today's show, you know, how to control, how to control emotional women, right? Well, first you have to understand the difference between instinct, emotion, and reason and how women process that emotion. So the first, the first kind of article of business that we need to get into here is uh, understanding how our minds process like our, the outside world, like, like external stimuli, right? I'm, let me use my, 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 you know, put the big brain hat on today. And usually it's, of course, through the five senses, right? Uh, sight, sound, touch, taste, you know, all the, all the good ones. <laughs> and, um, and that's how we kind of interpret our surroundings. So that really what happens is at that point, it sort of goes through the instinctual side of things because that's the most immediate side. Uh, how do we process that information? Then it goes through the emotional and then it, and hopefully it makes it to the rational or perhaps it goes through the rational and then it goes to the emotional, just depending on how, how we're looking at it. So... Um, I'm going to, I've got a, a few things that I wanted to dig into here. Let me see if I can throw this up on the screen real quick. I hope I got this right, didn't I? Yeah, I did. There it goes. This is the triune brain theory. Um, just to, you know, just sort of hit the ground running here. The lizard brain. I'm sure you've heard uh, me and several other, by the way, I'm not the first one to coin this, this term, but uh, people will talk about the lizard brain or they'll talk about the hind brain. This is the most basic base part of our understanding. Oh, 1960, there you go. So it's as far back as 1960. Uh, now, remember, I have to just a uh, full disclosure here because some people are going to take me to take me to the carpet on this. So I'm going to just get this out of the way to begin with. Uh, a lot of people think, oh, that that theory's been debunked. Well, yeah, back in the mid 60s, bad back in the early 70s when we didn't have access to information that we do in 2023, and I can understand why it was unpopular at that time, because this gives people a clear physical manifestation of how we process things, how we how we deal with emotions, how we deal with our, our, our reason, our gray matter versus our, you know, our limbic system. So if you look at the lizard brain right there, of course, that's the, the most rudimentary side of, <clears throat> of our understanding. OK, so you got brain and stem and cerebellum. OK, that's fight or flight. That's autopilot. Uh, I think to a degree, it would also be sort of like your autonomous nervous system on, on top of that, obviously. Like right now, I'm not thinking about breathing, but if I were, I can control my breathing. But if I if I have to start monologue monologuing for you, I'm not going to worry about like it is the, the breathing apparatus is moved to the, the periphery. 
And I think that's important to to bear in mind because um, part of triune brain theory is predicated, I think, on peripheral awareness and understanding like our surroundings. We have to you've got to remember that there that there's so many things going on right now. Uh, God, right now in my, if I, let, let's just use where I'm at right now as my example. Okay. I can see my monitor right here. I can see the camera right here. I've got a, a secondary monitor going over here. I'm looking at lighting effects. I've got my sound. I've got my board right over here. I've got my mic here. Hopefully I don't knock into it. Right. But I'm still talking and I'm still sort of, you know, delivering this. And my, my conscious, my cognitive awareness is really basically on what I'm, what I'm speaking about, but my peripheral awareness I can see where my 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 soundboard is. I can see where the input is. I can see where my stream deck is. Oh, those guys are back! There you go. Sorry, I had the wrong. One. But I so I've got peripheral awareness of of my surroundings, so I can let, allow that into my sort of cognitive process as I'm as I'm delivering the show. And people just do this naturally. We don't need. I mean, this is like a no brainer. People like literally, it's a no brainer. People don't understand that. Like, there's certain things that we're we're really good at multitasking to the point where. We have to push things off to the periphery so that we are still, you know, our peripheral vision can can see what's going on, but we're still focusing on what we're doing, whereas things are going on around us. So that concept is pushed off. The peripheral awareness is pushed off into the instinctual side of the lizard brain. So we've got uh, fight, flight, autopilot. Now, this is also, there's, there's, there's more complex behaviors that are associated with the instinctual side. So... For instance, I've used this example before. If I were to like say throw something at you, somebody threw something at me, I would instinctively flinch, right? Because it's it's like self-preservation, right? You want to fight or flight. You want to get out of the way. You want to. Uh, our revulsion responses, for example, like have you ever been? I know I've done this, but um, have you ever been with with a with a group of guys or you know you're, you're out partying or something like that, and, and somebody has too much to drink and they throw up, and then you feel the the need to like sort of throw it because you smell you like smell it and you like, Ugh, and you kind of get that that's a revulsion spot response that is an instinctual response now evolutionary theory says that that's the reason for that response that revulsion response is due to the fact that if somebody is throwing up in our ancestral past it probably meant that that person ingested something poisonous or a pathogen or there's something around them that forced them to throw up and the possibility that you also ingested that is pretty high so therefore it triggers sort of this autonomous need to, to, to yak. <laughs> that's an instinct. Okay. That's an instinctual response to the, the lizard brain, the hind brain. And then there's other parts of that, that, or, you know, again, instinctually pushed off to the, to the, to the periphery, uh, were certain events to, or, or certain circumstances to happen in your environment, you would trigger other instinctual responses as a result of that, because that's more important for you to, you know, draw breath, um, to, you know, to, to eat, to get, you know, to want to hunt food, to want to eat things. Um, there's the instinctual side of things. So that's how we interpret our surroundings through the instincts. Now, the next part of this is, and I'm, again, this is sort of the preamble to all this. So bear with me. This is the mammal brain or the limbic brain. This is emotions, memories, and habits. Okay. So these are, this is sort of the midbrain area. I want to say this is the cerebellum. I'm pretty sure. Again, I'm not a neuroscientist, but um, this is sort of the midbrain area, and this is where emotions are born. So, uh, one of the, re again, up, uh, the second reason, I guess, that I wanted to cover today's topic is because I've been reading through, once again, uh, or going back through the, uh, the book, um, Positive Evolutionary Psychology. And again, it goes back to the happiness thing. That's why I included Nuno Betancourt at the end of my, my videos today. Because he gets it. I, I love how he like instinctually gets it. He like, I mean, maybe he read it in some pithy little, you know, motivational thing, but he gets the idea that happiness is not a destination. Happiness is not a goal state. It's not something that is endurable. It is, is a sustainable place to be. It is not a ultimate outcome. It is a proximate outcome. And I love how he just sort of instinctually figures out, instinctually figures out that that's, it, happiness is in the doing. And that's going to be very important because when we're talking about controlling women's emotions or we talk about controlling our own emotions, it's important to understand exactly what emotions are. And emotions are born, of course, in that mid section right there. So we make our decisions, you know, make emotional decisions. I, honestly, I think probably we can update this from 1960, right? I think our rational minds, our, our, our gray matter, our reasonable minds can also make good decisions for you. And I'm going to also give you a, a very recent example of this. And it really kind of 
makes me choke up a little bit, but I'll tell you why in a second. Um, so when we're looking at emotions, problem that we have with emotions today is I think we in some ways glorify them and, and deify them. We turn them into these spiritual events. We think that emotion is something that is sort of outside of us rather than inside of us. And emotion is something that I can, I can, if you go and you shoot up a bunch of trend and you get roid rage and you get angry and frustrated and you're like, ah, you have basically used a chemical to change your emotional state. If you drink a lot of tequila and your clothes fall off, <laughs> you've just changed your emotional, congratulations, you've just changed your emotional state. There are ways we can change our emotional state. You can go from happy to, you can go from heaven to hell in a blink of an eye because of some situational condition that, that triggers that going from, you know, it could be fight or flight, you know, the instinct. Again, remember instincts feeds into emotion, emotion, of course, and feeds into, into rationality and reason. Okay. So when someone says that they're governed by their emotions or when the red pill, those red pill guys think that women are just this bundle of emotions, right? Or my all time favorite, the rational male, do you know how rational most men are? That's why I named the book The Rational Male. I love that response. It pissed people off. The rest, give me that. What's this rational male stuff? He doesn't know anything about anything. All right. That triggering that response. That's exactly what I wanted the cover of the book to do and successfully for over 10 years now. <laughs> That's what I was hoping for, right? It's triggering an emotional response, usually with women, but it's the it's this this scoffing and thinking that if I say the rational male, people think I, I get this all the time. Hell, I just got this from uh, from uh, from Marquette on uh, Saint Center. Like, what is a rational male? Um, my brand, <laughs> a tray, a registered trademark, <laughs> pretty much. That's, that's basically what, it, what it is. Or I would get introduced. Uh, I think even, even Adam Sosnick has introduced me as Rolo Tomasi, the rational male. Oh, all right. I'll own it. I guess that's never been like my, my point has never been to sort of like say, I'm the rational male. And this is how I, I'm, I'm Mr. Spock and fascinating behavior. I gotta raise my eyebrow a little bit. That's never been my motive, let's just say. But uh, <laughs> what does it trigger? Uh, when you when you say men are rational, especially when you're talking to like the average female, these even I don't care what generation from boomers all the way up to Gen Z right now or Gen Y or whatever the hell the next one is. Um, you, you say the rational male, it triggers women, it, especially women. And then, of course, you know, if it's, you know, more feminized, you know, male feminists, right? Allies, <laughs> I shouldn't even call them feminists. Allies, um, they'll say, they'll pretty much say the same thing. Oh, well, men are emotional too, don't you know? Gosh, you know, most wars are started by men. Like, as if that was the reason why. You know what? I'm feeling really depressed. I'm going to start a war today. Fuck it. More wars are start for wars are started for uh, re, our resource grabs mostly. <laughs> They're very practical. They're very pragmatic. If anything, starting a war is 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 some of the most practical, pragmatic things that you can do when it comes to like resource acquisition. Remember what I said: powerful men, uh, territory, uh, resources, and access to beautiful women. <laughs> when you think about it, that's war can can be a very you know pragmatic response i'm not saying it's right but i'm just saying that seems like it's the most it's the shortest distance between a and b so when when i, I love it when women tend to think or tend to put women or tend to put men into the same emotional class as themselves and i uh i'm, I'm gonna once i finish up the rest of this try and brain theory thing here the just to give you sort of a preview most women will think that most men are exactly like them when it comes to Relating when it comes to emotional accessibility, he's not emotionally available. Yeah, he's a dude. That's why we're not built the same. We don't have the same hardware installed. We don't have the same like OS installed in our brains either. But we're still pretending as if we do. And men are stunted or retarded or they are. And I mean that in the clinical sense or are um, in some way. Uh, there's something very, very wrong with men because they don't emote and they don't interpret and they don't. Uh, they don't feel the same way that women do 
for and, and are triggered by the same emotional stimuli that women are triggered by as well. And so women think that men are very blundering, stupid cavemen. And we're really not. We just lack the hardware. And I'm going to I'm going to point that out in spades to you to, to you guys today here in just a moment. So we go back to this, uh, the limbic system, of course, uh, emotions, memory, habits, uh, decisions, uh, when you are uh, reverting to your habits, whatever that happens to be, especially your sedation. Uh, if you are, um, got to remember that there's also a physical component to some habits and addictions, of course, but the, the, the mechanism for you returning back to that remedy to keep coming back to your sedation is from this part of the brain. So you keep going, oh, this feels good. I'm going to go back to it. Uh, when you see Alex Hormozzi or um, or uh, Andrew Huberman talking about like dopamine this and endocrinology that and blah blah blah, all right there. Where's the pituitary gland? Right in the center, right in the middle of all that bullshit. So yeah, you want to look I, again. I'm not a neurologist. I'm not a brain surgeon. I don't play one on the internet either. I'm just, just throwing this out there. Again, let's connect some dots together today, guys. So. Decision. Now, the, now the last thing here is we've got the human brain, which of course is the neocortex. This is the gray matter. This is the surrounding mass. Okay, this is where this is where all the magic happens. Really, language, abstraction, thought, imagination, consciousness, reasons, and rationalizes. Look, it's the rational man. That's where it happens in their gray matter. Now, so the things that you learn, the things that you retain, your long-term memory more or less are in that human brain, that neocortex part right there. Evolutionarily speaking, and this is again, my, my armchair uh, Evo bio lesson for you. Uh, evolutionary speaking, the, uh, the lizard brain, that red stem right there evolved first and then, and that's the fastest way to interpret your surroundings. So fight or flight, very, very quick. You will, and trust me, you get into a life-threatening situation, you will instinctively do things. Uh, I will give you an illustration. One of the things we have to teach our kids in driver's ed, I think they still teach this in driver's ed, is that if you find yourself in a skid, to turn into the skid. Don't slam on the brakes. Your instinct, this part of your brain, the, the limbic part, the red part right there, the autopilot, wants to slam on the brakes and go, oh, just stop the damn car. Because human beings didn't evolve. We didn't have evolutionary situations and environments where we were evolved to drive a car. Now we can use certain aspects of all of these, all of these parts of, of, of the brain in tandem, you know, in, in concert. But the problem is, is we never really evolved to, to drive a car, much less, you know, Lord knows nobody can drive a stick shift anymore, right? But uh, so we every bone in our body says do self-preservation, slam on the brakes, stop the car, stop the velocity, or we're going to run into that tree or we're going to skid out. And the problem is, is that that ends up making you skid that much more. Right. You slam on the brakes, you you get into a spin. I mean, especially if you're if you if you live where I do and you're on black ice, then, yeah, you're going to hit the hit the brakes and start spinning. It makes things worse. But if you tap the brakes and you turn into the skid and you get like that Tokyo drift thing going, like if you could get, get a little sideways, that's because you're turning into the skid and using the momentum of the car to sort of ride itself. And if you do that, you find out that if you do that accurately and you get with enough practice and you, with, and you settle your instinct down, your reason overrides your emotions and your instinct, you will find that you will ride the car. So that's that's one illustration of using all of these in tandem to sort of get out of a life threatening situation that otherwise you would slam on the instinctively slam on the brakes. and You would probably die or, or risk certain injury for sure. So, you know, the other uh, the other uh, illustration I like to use when I'm sort of throwing this one out here is uh, martial arts, for example. Um, it, it is not necessarily uh, in most people's nature to put their face in front of other people's fists. Uh, we tend to, as human beings, want to sort of back down from conflict. We're not, we're conflict, and let's say we're, con most of us anyways, <laughs> instead of likes to fight guy, right? Most of us are conflict averse. We would rather move away from a situation that's going to cause us bodily harm than to sort of get in there and fight. That's why we call it bravery. When we have to like teach young men at 18 to go to boot camp to be killers, right? That's what, you know, go watch what Full Metal Jacket, right? Just 
What is your major <laughs> malfunction, num nuts? Just go. Is anybody who's been to boot camp understands what I'm talking about? It's like turning that young man from someone who is who is conflict averse to someone who is more confident in conflict situations. Training, understanding, learning how to move, training, um, training. Uh, let's just say, was it long term memory? Was it muscle memory? So you've got these things. I'm going to throw this out here just real quick because I love this as an example. I use this recently. Uh, my son, to my son, to win in combat, you must let go of your conscious self. Why, master? Because motor memories are stored as implicit memories, not declarative memories. Trying to use your conscious brain for motor tasks is basically accessing the wrong database. Can you rephrase that in some mystical wisdom? Dwell in your inner, you know, in this. <laughs> Thank you, wise master. I've used this so many times as examples of metaphorical truth, and that's going to be a really important lesson for today as well. But the, the fact is, is this is understanding how to move and training like wax on, wax off, like like in a Karate Kid, having that having that motor memory. That's part of training your instinctive mind to react to certain things. That's the reason part of your brain, training your instinctual side to do what it needs to do at that particular time. So now we have, once again, I'm going to show you here one more time for the illustration here. You have all of these things working in tandem or concert, I guess. And it was more than two, right? So the fastest way, the fastest way to interpret your search, your surroundings, of course, is instinct. It's the lizard brain. It's the stem. The second fastest really is your emotional side. So when we say, oh, you're making an emotional decision, when you are buying something at the checkout line in the grocery store, you're, that's impulse buy. That's an impulse buy. That's an emotional decision. I, Lord knows I have made many emotional decisions, on, usually about my greyhounds. <laughs> I have made many emotional decisions. And so I am not immune to impulse buys. I'm not immune to any of that kind of stuff. However, I am more aware of it now. And the awareness part comes from the human brain side, the, the, the cognitive side, the neocortex, the gray matter side. And really what it boils down to is if you are making these impulse buys and you need to say, you know what, I really should curb that. Or you need to change something about your habits. Because remember, this is where the habits are. You want to change your habits to so your memories, your, uh, your emotions. You want to control your emotions. It is going to take your higher brain function to control those. It is an act of will. And uh, I will just put this out there right now when we're talking about, because I know people have sent me articles on this stuff about like, do we have free will? Is a, free will is just, a, is just a, a fabrication of the human mind. I, the jury's still out on that. Um, I, I understand the mechanic. I understand the logic and how they get to that per that perspective. I, I do, but I'm not ready to say it's it's 100% like you're, it's out of your your reach or it's out of your out of your control. I still think that there is a certain amount of of you know, personal decision making that you have to do, and they might be those decisions might be chosen from a certain you know set of you know choices that are you know you get a, a b or c but you're still making the decisions for a b or c uh depending on what it is now i could be wrong about that i probably am wrong about that but uh i'm still until i have like you know concrete evidence of of, of that i'm still going with free will for for the time being uh and i think that that gets <laughs> the whole free will uh, conversation gets really convoluted and it gets really you want to you want to aggravate somebody especially trad cons you want to aggravate trad cons uh, try to argue that there is no such thing as, as, as free will with them because it grates against the personal responsibility narrative that is like a, a foundational premise to that ideology or that with that way of thinking um and again i and i understand i understand exactly why it is that way but anyways getting back to this uh the, the rational and the reasonal reason side is the slowest of all three of these processes. It's also the one that developed and evolved later in the, in the timeline, let's just say in the epochs. <laughs> so we've got the instinct side, we've got the emotional side, which is the next step up. And then we've got the uh, surrounding side, you know, the surrounding gray matter of all this, and that's the slowest. So, the problem that we have now is the immediacy and what feels good, especially in an age right now where our emotions and tend to govern our decisions, tend to govern what we type out on social media, and we tend to prioritize that midsection right there, just emotions. And we can feel emotions so intensely that we think it's God talking to us 
through our emotions. Now, again, as I said, uh, you can change your emotions and you can alter your emotion, your emotive state, your emotional state with drugs. That's why women are prescribed SSRIs in such record levels right now. And again, it comes back to, and I'm going to just quote, once again, I'm going to use Nuno Betancourt here. The reason why we prescribe that those kinds of that to that degree, those kinds of SSRIs, antidepressants to to women is because we've sold women on this idea of a sustainable state of happiness that you, in fact, if nothing, if anything, they're entitled to that. This is what it should be. This is how you should be. You should have the best guy in the world, like that one chick that was in the, my intro videos. I hand select those for a reason. That one girl that was in the intro video saying, I'm not going to dumb myself down. I'm not going to, I'm not going to like, you know, dress down for some guy just because I want to get a man who's long-term, blah, 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 blah. He should, well, he should want me anyways. Blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm all that. Right? And I understand the pragmatism involved in that, but I also understand the emotion side that's involved in that too. No woman wants to feel bad about herself for, you know, all you ladies, you're all pretty, right? I mean, it's like, uh, what, what would you rate yourself? Oh, I'm at 10. Like that's, that's an emotional response because they've been conditioned to think that, that to, to build themselves up. It's that it's psych yourself up, build yourself out. Um, and again, that's that psych yourself up, that habit of doing that, that in, it's part of instinct and, and emotion at that point is to sort of protect it's an ego protection device is really what it is for women but it it comes back to this right here once again here we go so you're looking at the the the, the super fast part which is the the lizard brain the hind brain and then you've got the emotional side which is also very quick so by by rate of comparison is certainly much faster than reason okay reason is slow you have to learn things. You have to understand things. That's where intelligence and wisdom really comes from. Okay. You have to learn things. It's slower to learn things. You've got, to, if you're going to learn martial arts, how many, what is it? 10,000 hours to mastery. I think that's what uh, Robert Greene used to say, or it still is. Maybe it wasn't his quote, but what do you want to master? Well, how do you get, and how do you do that? Well, it takes, it's a process. It takes time. There's no like instant fix for the, you don't get to upload it. Like in the, in the matrix. I know Kung Fu. <laughs> You don't know Kung Fu. You have to actually do it. There's a process to it. And again, go, getting back to the happiness is a, prox, a, a proximate goal, a proximate outcome, as opposed to a, a, an ultimate state. We can, we can simulate that with drugs. We can simulate that with antidepressants. We can simulate that with alcohol. We can simulate that with weed or pornography or whatever is sedating you, whatever is sort of making you happy in the immediate, because you can stimulate the same more or less the same conditions that would you would otherwise have to work for that you would otherwise have to find some sort of joy or happiness in that particular moment because happiness happens as a process it doesn't happen as a particular goal state that's why i love the nuno betancourt uh video at the end of this is because it's not a place you get to it's the process and not enough people really can, that's why they say, you know, be in the moment. I know it sounds like really Zen and like Eckhart Tolle, right? Be in the moment. It's the way they call it the precious present. Well, that's like woo woo, you know, tea leavey shit. Really what it is, is a happiness is what is making you happy? What is making you depressed in that particular moment? What is making you sad? What is making you happy? What is making you, I know, anxious? What is making you hungry, <laughs> right? What is making you uh, angry at a particular time? Emotions are meant to drive us from one state into another state. They're, that's the function. That's the, the, out, the, the ultimate purpose, the latent purpose of emotion is to motivate the organism. And I buy that. I mean, like his, there's other mammals that feel emotive states as well. But in the case of human beings, um, it is meant to move you from an unsustainable state or a place that you don't want to be or that you probably uh, is not really maintainable or sustainable to move you into another state. Again, here's a really bonehead, simple uh, example of this is have you got hangry. Does your girlfriend get hangry? How many guys get fucking hangry? You ever seen those Snickers commercials where it's like the guy turns into Joe Pesci and he's like, oh, it's like in casino. He's like, ah, dude, fuck these guys. I'm going to kill them all. Ah. And then like give him a Snickers bar. <laughs> he eats a Snickers bar and then he goes, hey, man, you need some food. You know, you'll feel yourself. And then he turns back into like the average regular dude that he actually is. 
<laughs> How many guys do that? I, but I'm only asking this as sort of like a, a, a spur of the moment poll here because I see more women get hangry than I do guys get hangry. I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but I think women have less of a sort of an emotional control over their hangriness than men do. And I don't know if that's just simply because we can, because we're wired differently or whatever, like our, our brains are wired differently. But I would argue that there are certain behaviors, certain things that really piss guys off, certain emotional states, certain habits, certain ways of thinking, certain processes that women derive from the emotional and the instinctual side of their brains that men either supersede with rationality or they just simply aren't wired that way. Because I know that I, I'm not, I'm sure there are guys who get hangry, right? I'm not one of them. I don't like if I'm hungry, I just like, okay, how do I solve my problem? I don't, I don't get there. I can't eat if it's past six o'clock. We need to eat now. What the fuck is that coming from? Like it turned into a different part. Like you're possessed, right? Well, the reason why you get hangry or women <laughs> get hangry, right? Is because that anger, that frustration, that like it makes, I mean, think about it this way. In our ev evolutionary past, in our ancestral past, if you were pissed off enough, you would go and be motivated to move from one state hungry to being not hungry. Well, how would you do that? Well, you got to get pissed off and frustrated enough and anxious enough. And it has to be urgent enough for you to go and run down small game, right? <laughs> or to go out and like kill a caribou with your buddies, right? Go out and get the meat because if you don't, you're going to starve and the tribe's going to starve probably too. And I think probably if I have to really, I'm spitballing here, but if I really, if you really think about it, I think one of the reasons why women get more hangry than guys do is because men, 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 men were the ones who were the hunters. Yes, they were not this bullshit about, oh, women hunted too. fuck off. I can prove it to you that women were not the hunters. It was men who were the hunters. And uh, that's a that's this really pop psychology feminist bullshit narrative that's been, that got reheated again. I'm going to read you a in fact. I think maybe a little bit later, I'm going to read you why it is that um Actually, fuck it. I'm going to do it right now <laughs> while it's fresh in my brain here. I'm going to show you exactly why um, the uh, where did it go? I think I have it here. But this it keeps getting reheated and I am so sick of of uh, seeing this uh, this narrative get reheated by. Yeah, actually, you know what? I've, it'll take too long. I'm going to read the whole thing. I got I have an article on it. It's an Aporia art, art article. And. It just basically goes like this is although they may have found a woman, a female skeleton or two in the anthropological records where there happened to be like a, a bow and arrow buried with, you know, I don't know, brave or Mulan or whoever it was they're bearing with. That's the, the idea that women were the hunters is fictional. Uh, the article I was reading anyways, uh, what it's, it's an aporia article and it's kind of long winded actually. That's why I kind of didn't want to dig into it too much, but the, the idea that women are hunters now women did hunt, they did hunt, but it was usually by net and it wasn't women who were killing the actual animals caught and trapped in the net. It was men who were coming and beating them over the head. And then now you got a dead animal and you can go eat it and pull, the, pull the feathers out or whatever. So did women hunt in that sense? Yeah, they did. But small game, usually, usually by net, usually by trap. Were women fishing? Yeah, of course. Does that count as? I I think it does. Maybe they were, right? I think if women. I love it when women fish. I think it's great, you know, because I like to fish too, right? But uh, is that hunting? Does that count as hunting? Well, it's a qualifiable difference between like catching fish and taking down a caribou or a woolly mammoth or whatever the hell you know, <laughs> elephants, right? <laughs> And, and coordinating that. No, it was men who did that because men are biologically evolved for combat. Get it out of your silly head that women were hunters. They were not hunters, at least not to the same degree as men were. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> but um, I'm sure it feels good for, for the little ladies to believe that, but it's simply factually incorrect. Um, so... Uh, anyways, getting back to this, uh, but let me let me explain a, a few other things here. I haven't used this this graph in a while. There's a difference. There's fundamental biological wiring differences between men's brains and women's brains. Okay, so if you look at say the uh, the process here, I'm I have to actually pull up this myself. So I can 
read it. Uh, if you look at the male side of, you've got uh, information processing, more gray matter. Okay. This makes uh, men have, males have 5.6 times more information processing matter. Boys often excel in math with local processing skills. Okay. If you were to bring this up in a college campus right now, you would probably lose your tenureship. Okay. Because we live in an era right now of feels before reels. This is offensive. These biological facts are offensive. It's not that one is better than the other. And then this, in this instance, I'm going to actually, let me throw this out there real quick before somebody takes me out of context and all this. I understand the logic and I understand sort of like the, the incentive and the, well, the motivation anyways, behind thinking that, oh, men are superior to women in every way. I disagree with that. I don't think so. Simply because that goes back to men and women are equal. It comes back to what what are we in a val in a vacuum? And I know that Myron has talked about this before. You know, men are are, are they're biologically better and bi biologically superior, blah, 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 blah. Well, again, what's the challenge? What is the what what part of uh what goal is being like is the is the goal is the is the test, right? So if it comes down to processing information, well, perhaps it, perhaps men have an advantage, have a, a biological evolutionary proclivity because we have better information processing. OK, now women, on the other hand, have greater white matter. OK, connecting matter. Women have 10 times more connecting matter. They're better at in uh, integrating information, especially in language arts, of course. Right. Because what are women involved for? For communication. Now, you've heard me talk about how men and women communicate differently. Men, of course, on this guy here, great stellar example right here. Gray matter, information processing. Men tend to prioritize information in a conversation, in a conversation, information in a conversation. Content, what is being related, what information is being related. But like right now, I'm a guy, I'm, I, hope, I think most of my audience are men too. I am relating information to you. I'm not, I'm not inferring feeling. I'm not saying here's how you ought to feel about these things. I'm just in, I'm just giving you the information. Men tend to be very like, that's why women think we're dumb brutes, right? They're just simple. Well, they don't, they don't get together at Starbucks to catch up because they just, you know, I don't know. They're emotionally stunted. <laughs> no, no, we're, we're not. We're more focused on what's the, how do I kill the woolly mammoth? How do I take down the caribou? How do we get everybody? The, how, how do I sharpen sticks? Yeah, okay, we're going to sharpen sticks, right? It's information-based. Women, on the other hand, if you go look at this, here we go. White matter, connecting matter. Females have 10 times more connecting matter. They are better at integrating information, especially in language arts. Yes, of course they are, because women tended to rely on other women. It was survival of, well, really uh, strength in numbers, survival in numbers, so women tend to be far more uh, socialist, uh, com or, let's say communist, communitarian. They tend to think that egalitarianism is a better way to organize society than a hierarchy, which is, of course, what men tend to do. More information based. Women are more communication based. When women are communicating, it is on the context. It is on the feelings that are being transferred between the woman, the woman to woman, usually. And that's like when men and women try to communicate together. He's not communicating. He's not a good listener. Of course he's not. He's speaking a different fucking language than you. That's why. And you want to control women's emotions. This is the this is lesson number one right here. Understand that women are context based, not content based when they are communicating with you. And that is a source of endless frustration for most guys is they, well, she should just say what she means. It means what she says. Yeah, if she would, if she was a guy, <laughs> if she was a dude, sure, absolutely. But you don't, well, I mean, unless you're homosexual, you probably don't want to fuck a dude, right? You want to have some sort of relationship with a woman. So you're going to have to at least, I'm not saying you have to pander to her or simp to her or whatever in your vocal intonations or, or be more understanding and talk. I'm not saying you have to do that, but you do have to understand at least the basics. And the basics are women's communication is context based, not content based. That's why she gets upset with you when she doesn't think you're listening. And you're filtering out, okay, she said, we got to go to the grocery store. Okay, we got to do this. It's Christmas time. We got to go buy presents. We got to do something. For, we got to get dog food. We got to do, like, she's rattling off all this stuff about how she feels about all this shit. And you're going, okay, uh, dog food, presents, 
you know, uh, gas for the car, change the oil, but you, like that kind of stuff. So you're filtering out the, 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 the information side of it. And that's usually what guys do because we speak really kind of different languages in that sense. We're still speaking, obviously, the same English, right? But we're, we're, we're approaching that conversation from a much different perspective. And again, because we have different hardware, not because we're all the same and men were socialized to be this way. Fuck you. No, we weren't. We were born this way. We were genetically, evolutionarily wired this way. And men are not bad for doing that. And women are not bad for doing that either. Just simply how the brain was. It's like just the operating system. It's the firmware. It's just the hardware, the firmware, and the OS. <laughs> it's pretty much what it is. Now, if we keep going down here, let's look at the chemistry. Uh, let's see. For chemistry here, we got serotonin versus oxytocin. Uh, due to lower levels of serotonin and oxytocin, men are more impulsive and less likely to combat natural impulses. Wow. Maybe it's because maybe that would be a biological brain synapse reason why guys are more risk tolerant than risk averse. Does that mean that men? Oh, here's have you seen those? Have you seen those? Those? Uh, I don't know if it's a, a it might be a Twitter account, but have you seen those like memes where it's like, this is why women live longer. It has some like dumbass like it's a it's a it's a jackass, you know, skit or something. You guys doing something insanely dangerous, right? Well, yeah, because men tend to be more impulsive and we'll do stupid shit like that. Now, can we curb that? Can we use our rational brain so we can sort of like, hey, maybe I shouldn't jump off the roof with a parachute and see if it works. <laughs> yeah, we can, we can definitely do that. But we, that's why it's, you want to know why it's important to have a father in the house to help with that side of the brain. <laughs> because men, especially young men, don't have the capacity for abstract thinking till much later in life. That's why they need a man, a, a, a male masculine influence to go, hey, you know, it's probably not a good idea to, you know, jump off the roof, bro. You know, kid, <laughs> I know it looks like fun, but when you get down, it's not going to be fun. All right. So if you look at the difference between uh, oxytocin here and serotonin there, you can see the differences, wide differences right there. Now, if you look at memory here, this is another one. Uh, memory for the female side. OK, remember, half developed at 15 for men, half developed at age 11 for women, fully developed by age 30. Remember, what they say, you know, guys don't become guys. And men don't become men until they're 30. Well, here it is. Biological fact. Women, their brains become fully developed at 22. That doesn't mean they necessarily exceed or whatever, you know, they 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 blow. We, we blow guys out of the water because we're more mature at 22. Um, no, you're you just happens to be the biological fact. That's just how it happens. As as far as you're going to go, as fully developed as you're going to go, it only takes you to, to be 22. For men, it takes it takes longer. Right. Maybe it's because we have more information processing that has to sort of get has to be fully baked. Okay, memory, the hippocampus size, the hippocampus size or memory storage area is larger in females, increasing their learning advantage. Okay, again, I would argue that this is a result of women being the vulnerable sex and having to rely on others, having to notice their surroundings and be more fully aware of dangers and, you know, things that could like kill them or kill the baby. And that's another reason I, I think one of the reasons why we have that sort of that women definitely do have a communication advantage and they have a learning advantage because they have had to because they don't have the same physical advantage that men do. Men's power is overt. Women's power is covert. So this follows along with that. Does that mean women are better because they have a learning advantage? Maybe in, in some women. But it also means that maybe when a guy gets to be fully developed at 30, perhaps he has the advantage because he has more gray matter. She might get to it sooner, but you know, again, we are innate natural complements to one another, evolved complements anyways. Intelligence, spatial and mechanical functioning. The male brain is better at creating pictures and charts than writing explanations. Yes, we see things visual. You also wanna know why, why guys like are visual when it comes to sex? There it is. Men, don't see like the whole thing where women go, oh, why do women, why do men objectify as sexual objects? Yes. Yes, you are. Ladies, I hate to I hate to break it to you. You are sexual objects. That's just how our brains parse it out. There have been um, 
MRI studies of guys who've been sort of wired up, you know, with, b- wired up to the brains where they have viewed like sexy, like half naked chicks, like the swimsuit cover, uh, Sports Illustrated swimsuit edition. Like, it doesn't even have to be like naked, but like half naked chicks, right? Men tend to view those images from a, 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 a the, 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 the part before the sum. Okay. If, if that makes sense. It is also when they, when they are viewing these images, the area of the brain that is stimulated is associated with tool use as well. So it is a problem solving prospect to a guy when he sees a beautiful woman who is half naked, who basically is saying, you know, cause that's when you see someone, who, a woman who's half naked, it's also cueing sexual interest, whether it's virtual or it's not. That's how the hind brain, that's how the lizard brain is going to interpret it. Well, guess what? It triggers a part of male brain of the male brain that is associated with tool use, problem solving. And that's really male deductive nature is problem solving. Give us a problem to solve. Men tend to be interested in things. Women tend to be interested in people. And that again, how we are sort of how our brains are, how our emotions are, how our, our, our rationality is, those are just simply two biological facts. And again, say those things on a college campus, unless you're Dr. Steven Pinker, um, you get you get canceled for that because everyone wants to think that it's all about emotions and all about feels before reels. And if you say anything that goes against that, then you're subject to cancellation at that point. So now if we look at, let's go back here one more time here, uh, spatial and mechanical functioning for guys, uh, the male brain's better at creating pictures and graphs. Now the other side, intelligence for women, verbal emotive functioning. The female brain is better at handling the complexities and read of reading and writing. Again, goes back to those communication skills. So if I'm going to say men are better at, you know, STEM fields, uh, we're better at uh, math, we're better at uh, local processing skills, which I've just reading up reading off here. If I say we're better at, at charts, we're better at finding, by the way, men are actually better at finding their way back from like, they don't, I don't need no map, you know, they're, <laughs> they're better at like, um, locationing uh position geo positioning i guess maybe that's a better way to put it uh as much as women want to criticize them and say you don't ask for directions well that's because you know why because men when they are lost they're frustrated because they got lost because most of the time we don't get lost because we have an innate proclivity for a geolocation now if i say something like that it's radical But if I say women are better at communication, reading and writing, they're better at learning. They have a learning advantage and they're better at integrating information, all of which right here, straight out of the straight out of the book. That's okay. Oh, yes, 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 we are. We're so much better than those brutish, stupid cavemen guys. We can we can uh, we love to communicate. I can't believe they didn't cry at the end of Titanic. (laughs) So end result. Oh, wait, I got one more thing to do. Uh, Rest. The male brain must enter a rest state to recharge. Females can recharge without resting. So (laughs) if you ever, if you ever wake up from a good night's sleep and your, your woman is like sitting there watching you sleep, that's a scary, that's some scary shit. (laughs) She goes, Hey, I was just watching you breathe. (laughs) Now you know why (laughs) men need, men need rest. We, I think it's probably more of like a biological, like a physiological thing, but there you go. The male brain needs to recharge. That's why it's important that you get your what, six hours. I oh, know eight, eight hours of sleep. Is that what, what is Papa Swolio saying these days? Seven to nine hours of sleep. I don't know. Somewhere in there. I don't, I'm lucky if I average five hours of sleep, especially now with Ned where he's at right now. Anyways, this classic chart, one last chart here for you. Uh, oh shit. I'm sorry. It's so low res. Uh, this will give you, this is just another, uh, chart for the triune brain theory stuff. Okay. Mammalian brain, memory, sociability, maternal love, anxiety, fear, jealousy. So base emotions, basic emotions, not complex emotions. So there's much, it's much different. Uh, neocortex, logic, analysis, rational thought, controlling of control of emotions, language, um, mirror, mirror, morality, morality. Okay. Morality. There you go. <laughs> your morality stems from your gray matter. <laughs> lizard brain breathing temperature got it all that autonomous stuff in your instinctual side so now that we have sussed all of that out i am going to go back to the comments here and see all the ones that i have missed uh let's see what do we got at the top up here 
Did I miss any? I don't think I missed any. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to go backwards here. Are women actually better shooters? What's the deal with that? I don't know. Are they? Is there, I, I would, I would like to see that. I have now. So by the way, I have some questions exactly like this that I have pondered and I'm still trying to get like hard data on. I don't know if they're better shooters. You mean like at the gun range or something like that? It's a possibility. I think men have better hand eye coordination, but it could be that women ha are better at like accuracy. I'm not really sure. Uh, I, I would love, if somebody can dig something up about that, I'd love it. The other thing I wanted to say is I think this is me. I think women are better at smelling things than men do. Like my wife can smell shit that I, I'm, I'm sometimes literally shit that, <laughs> that I don't smell at all. And has it's been that way for 28, 27, 28 years now. I'm, I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced women have a better sense of smell than or maybe to, to a slight degree, maybe 10% better than men. I don't know. Because I tell you, man, I can smell, I'm, I'm maybe my smell sense of smell is, is shot, but my wife can smell in the parts per trillion. <laughs> I swear to God. And I think that the, there would be a, the reason for that would be because women would be more conscious of well, secure personal security, obviously, but they would be more, this is me spitballing here. I would think that in our ancestral past, women would have evolved a better sense of smell than men because they want to smell pathogens or like a dead body. Or like I said, you know, rev the revulsion response. It's never like, oh, that smells good. I smell honeysuckle in the air. No, no. It's always like, oh, did the dog fart? <laughs> That's really what it comes down to. I think that it's it's usually bad sense. I think women may, might be more, sensitive to bad sense. I have not seen studies or data on this. Don't, I, again, I am spitballing. I do not know that for certain. Versus men uh, don't finish, who don't finish their development until 30. Uh, oh, any new books? Evil Psych is hijacked at the moment. It is. Uh, the best books I think right now are older, are older published books, okay? And you probably heard me talk about this with uh, Dr. David Buss. I think David Buss has some really good stuff. Don't get me wrong. I think his, uh, especially uh, Evolution of Desire is great. Why women have sex, all that stuff. Like the, his previous work, 1994 up till about 2017, spot on. After that, uh, why uh, men behaving badly is a is a is a money grab, is a grift right there. Uh, it's meant to pander. And uh, if you know, if you've read anything of his previous work and then you read that, by the way, I'm not just going to, I'm not just poking at him. I would say the same thing of Robert Greene because I think 48 Laws of Power, brilliant, tour de force, masterpiece work. Uh, his uh, Laws of Human Nature, pandering, exactly the same. So I would go back to the old stuff if you're looking for, um, if you're looking for like a good <laughs> read, I guess. I still enjoy uh if you if you want to get into evolutionary psychology in the most base sense i would go read uh the ape that understood the universe by steve stewart williams it is entertaining and it is informational so it, so it has the best of both words if you're going to read and you're not bored by reading which of course you know according to you know marquette everybody's bored with reading um i would say that's probably a good place to start red queen the red queen by matt ridley classic really good one um, you could go selfish gene too, but you're, that's, you're really kind of going back with, uh, with Hitchens and that one, uh, uh evolution psychology wise, uh, alpha God by Dr. Hector Garcia. If you can get past his, uh, masculine apologist, uh, narrative in every damn chapter, uh, Marty Hazelton hormonal again, she has to get her feminist street cred before every chapter, get past that. And you get to the good stuff. Um, the one I'm really liking right now, and I, I'm sorry the, the author's name escapes me, is Positive uh, Evolutionary Psychology. I want to say it's Gehrer is, the, is the, the guy's name. He wrote it in tandem. So there's like a, a co-authored it, but really good. And uh, last but not least is Promiscuity by Dr. Tim Burkhead. Excellent. That's Evo Bio, really. Um, so read those if, you, if you're looking for good reads. Uh, let's see. Does women's full develop at 22 have an effect? Well, remember, you're, 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 you're not measuring the same things. Men and women's brains are not the same. We are not the same. Simple as that. We are more different than we are the same. And I wish people would just, just fucking cop to that. Because the reason they won't is because it goes against the blank slate narrative. It goes against the idea, well, women can be anything a man can't. No, no, you fucking can't. And you know what? Men can't be anything that a woman can be too. 
depending on what it is, what's the challenge? Men and men are not necessarily superior than women. Tell me what the challenge is, and I'll tell you who's the superior, who has the natural proclivities to excel in that particular challenge. Then we can talk about who who would be better fitted for that particular task. No problem. But until you can define the task, then that's what that's when you have to like you're going to evaluate performance. It has to be based on whatever the task and that challenge is. Okay communication, all that good stuff, you might, maybe women are better at them. You want to know why women get into communication, psychology, they get into human resources and stuff, because that's the natural proclivity. We need to get more women in STEM. No, we don't. They don't want to. And you could teach them and train them, but that doesn't mean that they necessarily want to do that. They have a natural proclivity or natural affinity for that particular thing. Sartain promotes Alex Harmozy, Jocko Wilnick, Willink, David Goggins and Andrew Huberman, white man science uh, are OK. They are. Uh, are they good to listen to about motivation, health and business or just not just not relationships? Uh, I like Alex Hormozzi quite a bit. I don't have a problem with him whatsoever. Um, uh, Jocko Wilnick. Good. Mm, I, I, of the of all of these, uh, I think Andrew Huberman is probably a little bit more science based. But you'll notice, I'm glad you noticed this, is every single one of these names that you have mentioned is in the man up, pep rally, motivational side of things. And they didn't always do that. So David Goggins, well, maybe David Goggins did. But I mean, David Goggins was, I think he is, uh, he's, he's good friends with like Dan Bilzerian, isn't he? I think he was military for a while. Again, maybe that's if, if that's what you're into and that's what you need some motivation, you need a pep rally, you need like, you know, somebody to psych you up, by all means, please do. You know, Andrew Huberman, great, brilliant mind, PhD, doctor, is he Dr. Huberman? Brilliant mind. But to get into the influencer grift, you still have to be like, it has to feel good at the end. It has to taste good. I can give you the, I can give you the worst news in the world, but it's a, hey, but don't worry about it. Things are going to be okay. <laughs> man up. It's just a challenge that a real man would get over. I'm like, stop it. Just fucking give me the information, please. Sans the bullshit. <laughs> God damn it. I, I read like, the, and, I, and by the way, and I like these authors and stuff like that, but the, what's the guy that wrote unscripted and uh, what's, I forget the dude's name. Uh, God damn it. Well, Gary V is another good, good example of this too. But these guys who are like, they're the one to tell you like millionaire, millionaire mindset secrets. Okay. They don't really get to the secrets until like the, like halfway through the fucking book because they have to tell you their, you know, Batman origin stories before they get there. And it's all fluff. It's like, I don't, I don't care that you were born a poor black child in the inner city and you're white. <laughs> I don't care. Just show me the game. Show me the process. Show me what it is you're doing that you think that I don't know. I, I get it that you came from nothing and anybody can do it too. I got it. Every one of these guys is saying the same damn thing. Just give me the freaking meat and potatoes, please. Rolo, how much importance do you place on psychology of attachment styles? Oh, good. Uh, anxious, avoidant, secure. Are women who are anxious and avoidant completely useless for long-term relations? Okay. So there is... Okay. There, there's two ways of thinking about this. The first one is the old school way, which is... Uh, the attachment styles. Attachment styles were part of the cognitive humanist uh, psych psychological, you know, uh, school of thought, let's just say from like, the, I want to say the early to mid 70s. And it's like, I'm okay, you're okay, th that kind of stuff. Um, is there some truth to that as far as like uh, big five personality um, uh, qual you know, qualities and so? Yeah, there is. But uh, as far as the attachment stuff, I think a lot of that has been kind of pushed to the wayside. Uh, simply because personality is, is malleable. So who, who you were before you went to deployment and you come back with PTSD, do you have a secure or avoidant, you know, uh, attachment to your wife when you come back from, from, you know, from Vietnam? Well, it, it's it, uh, the, the problem with uh, attachment styles is they tend to promote the, well, the old school way tended to promote a permanency of those things. And again, I think it was really for want of a categorization, wants to categorize people, categorize. That's, you want to know why astrology is such a big deal or you want to know why numerology is such a big deal is because human beings want to see patterns. They want to put people into boxes. They want to put you into a category. There's only three kinds of guys. Let me tell you who they are. There's the invisible guy and then there's the alpha male and there's the, the destiny guy who's a fucking male feminist and blue like 
everybody wants to put people into a category. And in some in some, you know, some ways you can see like archetypes for sure. But my issue is with the need to put them into those categories because human beings love patterns. We want, we're, we're very good at one of the, the best things we, have, we ever did with our big brains is pattern recognition. The problem is, is we get in trouble with that because we tend to see patterns that aren't actually there. So if you've ever been staring at the clouds with your kids and you go, Oh, it's like, it looks like a Tyrannosaurus Rex. That looks like an elephant that like, we will see patterns. Our brains will, f- will fill in the blanks for us. You want to know why like impressionist painters, we're such a we're all the rave back in the days because they didn't have to like do everything very super detailed like pointillism and the you know uh, expressionism and and you know they didn't have to 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 do uh, you know imp- the impressionists didn't have to fill in the whole picture because they knew that the human brain is going to fill it in for you. It's a beautiful picture, right? I mean, it's art. <laughs> but that's the te- that's the male br- or male brain. It's, it's human brain. You know, women too. We we tend to fill in the blanks when we don't see something. Right? It's like what was it the uh, uh, when you're focusing on so they used to do these these uh, this is a psychology test is a gorilla the gorilla suit test the guy in the gorilla suit test and you'd be focusing on some speaker or something like that, and a gorilla a guy in a gorilla suit walks across the thing and you don't even see it. like nobody saw the gorilla the guy in the gorilla suit walk walk by the thing I mean the people who did it's funny as hell but like most people don't see that because they're too focused because again like peripheral awareness are too focused on whatever that speaker is saying to notice that there's a, a literal gorilla that just walked across the walked across the stage right. Because we're, we tend to be really, you know, focused on things, but when we're looking for patterns and we're looking for pattern recognition, we apply that to like pretty much everything we want to do. So we we want to say, oh, all whores are like this. All men are like this. All guys are, well, there's only so many, there's, here's the three different kinds of guys. And let me explain to you why you know, that makes great TikTok content, but it doesn't, it's not really productive. It's not really substantive. Uh, I think the, the I'm, I'm more fascinated with the fact that we would actually want to think of what's an attachment style, what's not. Well, attachment, I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing. Uh, it just depends on how, like, you can, can you be codependent on someone? Sure, you can. Um, but I think that I, I'm fairly certain that attachment theory, attachment styles has been up updated since the 1970s. So... Uh, I do I give it much credit? I think it certainly made a contribution. I don't necessarily think it's the be all end all. Thanks for all love the content. A uh, long time, lo- long time luck. Thank you, Andy D. And there we go. Finally got to James. Uh, I just texted a dozen of my male divorce clients and told them. God damn it! Sorry. There you go. That's for you. You will always get those, my friend. I just texted a dozen of my male divorce clients and told them to immediately log on, log in. They can't afford to miss a subject. Uh, the, the subject Professor Rolo, t- Rolo is teaching today. Thank you very much. Welcome to class. Here you go. Thank you. Hello there, children. Yes. How's it going? You're welcome. Uh, where do we got here? Every argument I've had with a woman, she tried to treat me like I was a woman. Yes. Oh, fuck. Hold, hold that thought. We're coming back to that one for sure. Why are these things not starring? I think they need. I think I set the auto star to off. Uh, rational trucker. I don't hide looking. Uh, I don't hide looking at women or flirting. My wife has been suggesting we go to a club downtown for New Year's Eve. Uh, the way I handle emo- my emotional wife was acting indifferent. Uh, say you're going to be OK. Little, you're going to be OK, little girl. OK, so, so really what that is, is amused mastery, uh, which, by the way, you probably just do inst- instinctively, <laughs> which is great. Um, in fact, here you go. I'll give you one. of those. That was good. Dealing with women's emotions. So now we know that men and women do not process emotions the same. I will explain here. You don't believe me? We're going we're gonna to move on to, to the next part of today's topic here in just a second. This is good, though. I want to come back to Viking Dad. Every argument I've had with a woman, she tried to treat me like a woman. Yes. So here, listen up. Here's your, here's your, your lesson for today, your little tidbit lesson for today. This is a, this is a maxim. This is a, it's going to be in the book of Maxims, but uh, I just recently uh, typed this out for Gia McCool. And um, you guys probably already know what I'm going to say uh, when it comes to friendships and things like that. Men and women have boyfriends and girlfriends. If you aren't fucking her, you're her girlfriend. And when I say that, or I type that out, boy, do people lose their ever loving shit. What do you mean? We're going to fuck every girl that walks by. We can't be fans. I'm like, Jesus, shut the fuck up. Just like, can you process, like, slow down, man. Process that. Read it one more time. 
slowly. Women have boyfriends and girlfriends. If you aren't fucking her, you're her girlfriend. That you're her girlfriend part. That's the salient part of that little pithy little maxim. Okay. The reason why is the reason why I say that is exactly the reason is exactly the, what you're experiencing here. Viking dad. She treated me as like I was a woman. If you treat her like a celebrity, she will treat you like a fan. If you're not fucking her, you are her girlfriend. Why is that? Because when men start communicating like women, women's hind brains, where'd they go? There you go. Women's hind brains, that little part right there, the little lizard brain, that red stem right there. <laughs> women's hind brains interpret you as a female. So if you are trying, and most guys will try to, you want to know the, the, the greatest downfall of like male feminists or like cuttlefish, right? The cuttlefish uh, mating strategy, cuttle, C-U-T-T-L-E, fish, like cut, because cuttlefish try to impersonate female, male cuttlefish try to impersonate female cuttlefish. And so because it's, it's what uh, Gad Saad, by the way, I'm pretty sure it was him that coined this, right? It's called sneaky fucker sexual strategy. Slip in and identify with the females uh, try to look like a female, try to align themselves, try to think like a female, identify with the females, be a male feminist, right? And then spring it on them. I got a heart on surprise. I got a dick, you know, and then that's basically what male, male cuttlefish who pretend to be female cuttlefish do. Once all the alpha males swim away, <laughs> they have integrated themselves in because that is a mating tactic amongst cuttlefish. That's why if you hear me refer to cuttlefish, that's what I mean. Not cuttlefish, cuttlefish. So that is the, uh, the, the strategy anyways. But the reason why women will view you as a girlfriend is because you are communicating as a female does. So if you adopt the, a female communication style, as I was saying before, uh, where'd it go? Here it is. The, uh, from the connecting matter. Is, is it a connecting matter? Side? Yeah. Females have 10 times more connecting matter. Uh, they're better at integrating information, especially language arts. Uh, then that learning advantage. And then, of course, there's the communication side of things here, which is reading and writing. I already talked about that. But if you start to communicate as and I'm saying I was just saying a few minutes ago, it's important to understand how women communicate. I'm not saying you should always default to that because you'll run into exactly what what uh, what Viking dad is talking about here. And that's why I say anytime if you if you think you're going to be her friend, if you think you're only oh, be friends first. If you aren't fucking her, you're her girlfriend because her hindbrain will interpret your communication and your interest in her and your uh, palling around and being platonic friends and all this other good stuff as another female. So that's a, again, it comes down to the, the communication style. What's the is it contextual based? Is it feelings? When we've talked about guys who become like this is old school, by the way, this is like old school pickup artist, right? When we talk about emotional tampons or these guys who will like they'll, they'll be front phone friends or they're the they're the beta orbiter. I'm here for you, girl. I'll be the perfect boyfriend for you. Don't worry. You don't go back to that guy again. Like that's those are the guys that women call when they're in their, you know, they're in their luteal phase <laughs> of their ovulation cycle. And they just, you know, they I, I got that guy fucked me. I can't believe it. You know, he's a jerk. He's a jerk. He's a jerk. He's a jerk. And then she, yeah, you're listening on the phone trying to like, oh, if I just if I just identify with her and i just uh you know i'm here for her i comfort her i'm i'm here for her feelings i'm an emotional tampon then sooner or later i'm gonna get in there yeah probably when she's 30 31 <laughs> and the chips and she needs somebody to go home with before the lights come on at the club um but uh that guy that that's the that's the sneaky fucker side of things but the reason why that guy doesn't get any traction is because he emotes and communicates like one of her girlfriends. That's why I say ergo, if you're not fucking her, you're her girlfriend, at least from hindbrain perspective. See, I just explained a maxim for you. I just gave away part of my book. I should be charging higher for this. Somebody give me a good, give me, give me a tip. Somebody give me a tip. Uh, a green amp, sorry, Viking dad, a uh, green amp fly fogging are superpowers in all SI situations, uh, all situations. Yes. Uh, if you don't know what those are, you can go pick them up and you can understand them better in my fifth book, the player's handbook. And I think I am caught up. Am I, uh, where'd it go? Can I put the auto chat? I, I suppose I thought it was supposed to be on. Okay. There we go. All right. Well, now they're on. 
don't know why it wasn't starring these things. My bad. There we go. <laughs> yes, I remember this episode. So it makes her sponge worthy. <laughs> the vaginal, what was it? The contraceptive sponge. <laughs> I got that. I understood that reference. Thank you. Uh, Siege D. Uh, Machiavellianism. Are there female specific behaviors that would benefit men if they employ? Yes. Uh, strength in numbers, self-interest and abundance of the dark triad of personality traits. Machiavellianism is the one that will take you the farthest. Remember when I tell like guys so want to say, well, um, well, chicks dig jerks, Rolo. So you're saying I should become a jerk? No, I'm saying you should harness the energy and the power of the jerk <laughs> and that energy, for lack of a better term, and I don't mean Brazilian power crystal energy, the harnessing sort of the attitude or the behavior set of the jerk is Machiavellianism. It's self-interest. It is, oh, I don't know, uh, enlightened self-interest. It is a mental point of origin. Imagine that. I'll tell you right now, the guy, what, what's his name? Uh, the Tinder swind the Tinder swindler. <laughs> Definitely he was his mental point of origin. I I I barely confident in saying that. Uh did I catch you all the way? Okay. I don't know about the shooters thing. I somebody needs to I really I really want to look that up. There we go. Ah, the fact that women and men are educated the same way is an example of social constructionism. Yes. Rejection of the body, of the body fundamentally. Yeah, because all of that education system was established, well, certainly in the 20th century, maybe they'd go back to the 18th century if you really want to. And yes, I understand the Austrian, what, we're going to make the perfect slave. Got it. You don't have to remind me of that. But I will say this is that even that school, even the idea of like putting, you know, kids in classrooms and putting men, putting boys and girls in classrooms, uh, like the idea that men and women are the same, it's based on blank slateism. It's based on social constructionism and blank slate that because we didn't fucking know any better when we were developing that system. So when people say, well, you know, uh, when, when I say, and by the way, I'm quoting uh, Camille Paglia when I say this, because I credit where it's due. When we say that uh, we uh, raise our boys or we educate our boys as if they're defective girls, that's a direct um a direct extension of that idea. So social construction is there's three great fallacies that we still cling to today. If you want to read about these more, you can go to what Steven Pinker's book, another book. It's really good. Um, called the blank slate. Uh, it, there's blank slateism, social constructionism, and uh, well, social construct, social constructionism, the blank slate, uh, the naturalistic fallacy, which we still keep coming back to all the time. And uh, oh, and then ghost in the machine, the, the, the spirit, mind, body separation like those. Those are, well, four kind of fallacies that we keep we, we standardize on. We built we build religions on them. We build politics on them. We build we organize societies based on we certainly organize our, our, our education based on those and still are and still think that they're, they're in some way valid. So when I talk about like if I have a problem with, like, say, Carl Jung or if I have a problem with. Um, uh, like Karl Marx, Carl Jung, like I was, I got into this by the way, and I, I hate this as a side note. I'm sorry, but I got into this conversation with, um, with Marquette on, on Saint and Sinner. And we talked about Marxism and I, I tried to explain this as best I could. And again, this is, you know, you're sort of running into this emotional wall when you explain these things. But the reason why I have the biggest problem with Marxism is because we we still standardize on it in some way, like our marriage, our ideal egalitarian marriage is based on Marxism. You will hear, you will literally hear women say this. Well, if he's better at one thing than I am, then he should be doing that. It's not about division of labor. It's not about gender roles. He's better at, oh, I don't know, manual labor. And I'm better at, uh, you know, cooking or I'm better at, and, and I'm like, but he's your partner, right? Yeah. Well, he's your comrade, right? <laughs> He's, you're not going to call him a husband because you want to pretend that things are still 50, 50 and you're living in this sort of like equal partnership. That's not a marriage. It's never been a marriage, a traditional, like conventional marriage, but we still have these idea that if, well, we still want men, but we don't need men. So if we marry the men that we want, what does a marriage like look like, like that? Well, it's 50, 50, it's a 50, 50 partnership. Ah, da, da, da. Yeah, and that 50, 50 partnership echoes the arrangement of Marxism. 
from each's from each's talents to each's needs. I forget. I'm, I'm butchering. I'm paraphrasing that. But that's pretty much the same premise for a 50 50 egalitarian marriage is based on Marxism. I tried to talk with this with uh, Andrew Wilson at one point and he, he laughed. He's, he's like, yeah, but uh, so if you look at where to go, the fact that women, men and women are educated uh, in the same way as an example of social construction. Yes. Uh, we're still clinging to that idea. We still think that social constructionism is the be all end all for organizing society, for educating children, for our ideological bent, our uh, our political, our politics. We still still can't abandon the social constru uh, social constructionism in that it is the primary reason why people are the way they are. It's bullshit. And I will tell you right now, it's it's already been disproven. It's already it was disproven a long time ago by. The four laws of behavioral genetics. The the question or the debate on nature versus nurture is over and has been over for a long time. It's not to say that there aren't certain environmental and circumstances that will you know contribute to somebody becoming sort of a, a master musician or a master at what you know mathematician or whatever. Understood. There are certain you know you have to have some sort of opportunity to develop those innate skills, but it is downstream from biology. Still, still don't want to 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 deal with that. Uh, let's see where do we go. Um, did I catch everybody? I'm just not getting the stars up here. Uh, let's see. There it is. Uh, damn it! I just bought one. Well, read it, Siege. Do read it and then tell me what you think. I you'll probably be able to get about halfway through it before you go. Okay, this is just pandering nonsense. Here's what you do, Siege. Read that book and then tell me who you think it was written for. What sex do you think it was written for? And not just like ignore the title and and try to ignore the title and and tell me who you think it was written for. Machiavellianism. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll, I will come back to uh, Dark Triad here in just a second because that is actually something in my notes. And I'm scrolling through the rest of these and I don't know why the auto star is not working. But I do have Sammy who's watching out for me. Thank you, Sammy. Oh, okay. Got that. Got that. Got that. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to catch up to snoopers here. <laughs> Just the tip. Thank you for the tip, Sergio. There you go. Ned, by the way, all proceeds from today's show goes into Ned's medical fund, whether I want them to or not. Uh, doesn't Mike Sartain say using female friends as a form of preselection is effective? Yes, as a uh, as a form of ye manipulating women. Sure, um, using female friends for sure. The would you like me to explain what my difference with my differences uh, between my, my theories versus versus Mike's? Uh, uh, people will say that Mike is has a vested interest in promoting the idea that men and women can be friends, and I understand that. Yes, and and the answer is yes. <laughs> Uh, I have, I've come to a, when I come to a different kind of estimate. I think about when it comes to like female quote unquote friends. Okay. I think that men and women cannot be friends in the same sense that men and men can be friends and women and women can be friends. As I said before, the idea of like what you, what women have boyfriends and girlfriends. If you're not fucking her, you're her girlfriend. That's the the biggest hurdle I think most guys have when it comes to having a quote unquote, you know, a platonic friendship with a woman. And then there's also the sex thing from the opposite side. So if that guy who has a female friend, however, like even in the in the most ideal circumstances, as soon as he gets intimate with another woman, what happens to that friendship? So. I would say I'm, I'm just going to throw this out there. I'm not so, like, oh, see, the problem is, is like when I put that out there and I say, well, you know, men and women can't be friends in this to the same degree that men and men can and women and women can because we have different criteria and we have a different frame of reference for our same sex friends than we do for our opposite sex friends. I'm not saying that you have to be a dick about it, right? Oh, I don't want to have anything to do with women. I'm not going to be their friend. What kind of asshole even thinks that is what I would like to say now. Can you be friends with them? Yeah, I'm friends with a lot of the women that are on Access Vegas. Do I go to movies with them? No. Do I go over to the house and like paint our nails together? Fuck no. But I, when I see them, I say, how are you doing? Maybe you want to talk about business. Hey, what are you doing? Are you doing a podcast? Are you doing like those kinds of things? Sure. You can be a friend in that sense. I would, I, I very much love Tiffany Fox. I very much love Domo. Porn stars, both, right? 
And are they friends? Yeah, I consider them friends. Icy, consider her a very close friend. Love her like a sister. Okay. I love, uh, I'm trying to think who else I, I talk to on a regular, a lot, a lot, many, uh, Maya, Maya Allegra. That's not a real name. Uh, Maya, I love like a daughter. And uh, I mean, people, I, I probably have more pictures with Maya than anyway, any of the rest of them. But like, we talk about, we talk about good shit, right? She was on the show with, uh, with Robert Kiyosaki because we can carry on a conversation, but I'm not like, Hey, why don't we go? catch a show together like let's go bowling you know? <laughs> so that doesn't come out of my mouth okay there's a difference in the quality is what i'm explaining so and i think that really needs to be sort of um emphasized i think i'll try next time i have that that back and forth with mike i probably would try to emphasize that uh hi rollo just wanted to ask do you think the uh, do you think with red pill knowledge men could reprogram themselves to stop loving women idealistically no Unfortunately, no. And, and secondly, I don't think you would want to. I think that there's an idea right now that the red, the red pill in some way promotes this idea of being like completely 100% logistically logical. You're Mr. Spock. The ideal red pill guy is Mr. Spock. Fascinating behavior. Captain, fascinating behavior. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> You got to raise the eyebrow, right? No, I, so here's, let me, maybe this is a good time to insert this into the conversation as well. I will, I would never advocate guys like complete, like kill off their emotional side. I would say be less dependent on it. I think most guys are tend to be that way. We have to be trained, I think, from a very early age to get in touch with our emotions and be more emotional and be more expressive and be more vulnerable and be more blah, blah, blah. Yeah, because from the time Johnny's five years old, he's taught as if he's a little girl. That's why we have prioritized emotionalism above rational empiricism for way too long. And certainly in this country and in most Western societies right now, we have prioritized the feminine experience, the female experience above and beyond, like grossly overblows the male experience. In fact, to be male is almost to be like, uh, you know, retarded and in the clinical sense, uh, is to be, you know, d to be stunted. I, I, I use this example all the time, which is like, you know, just because you didn't cry at the end of Titanic doesn't mean there's something emotionally wrong with you guys. It just means that that should, that particular tearjerker at the end, it appeals to a female psyche. It doesn't appeal to a male psyche. If you cried at the end of saving private Ryan, 100% legit. I get it. Feel it. Feel you, brother. But at the end of Titanic, no, no. I, I cried too. Oh, I can't believe that a guy like Rolo's telling men not to cry. Oh my gosh. What a chauvinist. What a 1950s caveman chauvinist. No, I'm just saying you don't have the fucking hardware. You don't have the, the same synopsis. However, you can be taught and conditioned to feel bad about not crying at the end of fucking Titanic. How do we know that? Well, because we can train ourselves to override our instincts. As I was saying before, using the rational brain to turn into the skid. Our instinct is to slam on the brakes. Oh, our instinct is to say, well, what's the big deal about Titanic? Oh, well, we can condition Johnny to cry on demand to think that he should be more emotional like a woman, like a female. And if he doesn't, he's going to be reprimanded for that. He's going to be ostracized for that. Or there is something very, very wrong with Johnny. We can gaslight Johnny into thinking that he has a, an emotional. He's not emotionally intelligent, which is bullshit. There's no such thing as emotional intelligence. It's horseshit. It's 70s, 80s. Feel good cognitive humanistic psychology pop psychology bullshit proven to be bullshit in the 90s proven to be bullshit anytime you hear some woman go oh we're more emotionally intelligent than men no no you're not because that's the, it doesn't even meet the criteria for intelligence you're more emotional than men are because women prioritize emotion before reason men unconditioned tend to prioritize reason before emotion that's why we don't cry at the end of fucking Titanic. It's a movie. We just, we know we're in the movie. Our rational brain says, oh, yeah, okay, it's good. It's like crying at the end of Predator. Nobody's going to do that. 
what what's a tearjerker for a guy? I'm sure that you can probably you probably cried when old Yeller died or God, don't watch Marley and me. Do not watch that movie. I I mean, good movie. Don't watch it. Do not watch it if you love dogs. Do not watch that fucking movie. But um, but the the emotion, instinct, emotion, and reason. Women tend to prioritize emotion before reason. That goes instinct, emotion, reason, and, and for men, it's also instinct. It's the first thing, reason, and then emotion. Because men have to learn things. We have to we have to be the ones who say, you know, okay, we got to figure out how we're going to kill the woolly mammoth, right? Don't care how you feel about it. Well, we might get killed. I'm a little scared and insecure. Yeah, you are, but you know, sack the fuck up, and here's how we're going to do it. Look at the cave painting. Somebody else, somebody else did it. We can fucking do it too, right? <laughs> it's that rational side. It's the rational. You're going. That's what we're about the rational male, right? When men, unconditioned by a gynocentric social order, have the ability to sort of like allow their natural proclivities to flourish, as I said before, there's still an element of the environment, right? But you allow those natural proclivities to flourish. Yes, men tend to opt for reason before they opt for emotion. In fact, women take take that as a point of pride. They have they're more empathetic. We have this supernatural empathy. No, you don't. You just prioritize emotion before reason. That's why. You're not, oh, we're we're more sympathetic. It's like the Florence Nightingale effect. No, no, it's because you prioritize emotion before reason. I can show it to you right here. Here's the here's the freaking fMRI studies. Here's the connectivity studies. Here's why men and women are different on the molecular fucking level. Oh, no, no, it's magic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whatever. But can you, okay, so but, but better, more, more to your point. Can, you, can we program ourselves to, to stop loving women idealistically? We do. Too many guys take the red pill and think that it's some sort of recipe for them to turn themselves into Mr. Spock. And I don't want you to, hell, I, if, if I don't deal in shoulds, I think men need to be more judgmental. I think women do too. I don't think there's any shame in being discerning and judgmental of people's behaviors and their, and their motivations for those behaviors, especially. Um, we live in an age of feels before reels. We prioritize feels before reels, reels being rationality and reason. Emotion before reason. We use the language of emotionalism, the, the female language of emotionalism, before we're ready to use the language of empiricism, the male hierarchical language of empiricism. I've said this before. I'll give you the quote one more time. Is any t- whenever <coughs> emotional at the 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 language of empiricism will always sound like hate or anger or violence or hostility to the language of emotionalism because it counters because it 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 breaks the the reality distortion bubble that is the language of emotionalism. So it's easy for me to say like stuff like, well, you know, if you're going to um, compare men and women in like women's sports and you have a guy who is a, uh, God, I hate to use this term, troon, <laughs> a, 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 a gender uh, confused, I can't, cause I can't, a trans am, uh, a Pontiac trans am gets into female swimming. He's the number 436th swimmer in men's swimming. He becomes the number one uh, swimmer in female swimming because he identifies as a female. Right. So really the empirical, uh, the empirical reality of that is that men are better swimmers than but women are simple as that. He's the number one female swimmer, but he sucks when you put him in a pool with a bunch of men. <laughs> simple. But the problem is, is we don't want to feel that way. We don't want it to feel well. Men and women can be anything they want to be, and you can identify whatever you want to. And and, and gender and sex are separate. And but no, no, they're not. I can show you the number one female swimmer, and he's a guy. He's got a dick. <laughs> okay, and, and this is not me trying to be salacious or trying to be funny or to make some stupid like comedy skit like Daily Wire is. I'm just pointing at the fucking facts. You could see it right there, black and white. It's not hard. And what happens is that is the language of empiricism. He is the number one female swimmer because he's that good because he's male smashing headlong into emotionalism. Well, we everybody should feel special and everybody should be able to identify the way they want to. And please use my pronouns and that. No, no, that's emotionalism pronouns. That's the language of emotionalism. We have to pander and, and pretend we're all we got to pay a pander to the kid. You know, OK, you be whatever you want, a demi boy, whatever the fuck you are. Right. 
We're going to make some shit up. All right. I'm going to go with that. Hey, we got to make him feel special. Give him his participation trophy. He's, he's got, he came up with a new gender. <laughs> We're doing good, Johnny. That's really all you're doing. In fact, if I was, if I was that guy, if I was somebody who was like, you know, of that mindset, I'd be, I'd feel like, like you're patronizing me. Fuck you. Right. But it doesn't work that way. Cause everybody wants to feel special, but I don't think that we should even attempt to reprogram men to uh, stop loving women idealistically, because I think that as actually a feature and not a bug, it can be a source of manipulation in a gynocentric social order for sure. But it can also be the source of great acts of heroism. It can also be the source of, uh, uh, of, of conventionally positive masculinity on top of that. I don't think it's necessarily a, it is what it is. Like your our men's natural proclivity is to love women idealistically. Women love men opportunistically. And I don't mean that in the negative connotation. I'm just saying that that's just how it is because women are the vulnerable sex. Men are the sacrificial sex. Eggs are expensive. Sperm is cheap. With birth rates collapsing, <laughs> they've been collapsing a long time. The social constructionist narrative will collapse. It won't last forever, but it won't change through democracy. It won't, but it won't change through democracy. You're not going to be able to convince people to go against how the machine actually works, especially when it works in favor of that particular gender or that particular sex's uh, interests. So like when people say, well, you know, we need to really repeal the 19th. I'm like, good luck. Tell me how you're going to do that. I'm all for it. Tell me what's the plan. <laughs> and what do we do once we do? <laughs> no one has a plan for that. It just it, it gets clicks. The click through rate is great for repeal the 19th, but nobody can tell you when, when the revolution's over, how do we reorganize society? I don't know. Let's just fucking go. Yeah. No, miss me with that shit, please. This is for the dog, the dog, the dog has a name. His name is Ned. You are a dog. What? What? Okay, wait. Caps Lock Hustler. Rose all the fuck. He done had a chat catalog for a little minute now. There. There you go. There's your Caps Lock hair. Well, welcome to the show, my friend. Welcome to the show. Down the Marco, Marco. Caps Lock Hustler. If you're going to type it out in caps, that's how I'm going to read it. <laughs> you're going to be an idiot. I'd be happy to do it. Uh, just spent $2,000 on my poodle. Dude, that's a that's a bargain. <laughs> I built for X-rays and uh, four since the tard nugget ate a tard nugget. Well done. Uh, ate then vomited a chunk of his chew toy. I wanted uh, an additional three thousand dollars. Oh, they wanted an additional three grand for to five grand uh, total for keeping him overnight for observation. I took him home and he's fine. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Yes, I, have, I hate this. I absolutely hate this because I the people that have been like helping Ned, have been helping us with Ned have been so good. So, so fucking good. But I have to I have to also I hate that I have to do this, but I have to temper my sort of hope and my, you know, my optimism. I and mean, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about Ned right now. Don't get me wrong. But I have to tempt, I have to uh, you know sort of temper that with the idea that they're still in the business to make a shit ton of money. And at this stage, I don't care about spending. I can eat the cost at this point, but I also know that I also have a personal injury attorney that is like, like tallying every last thing that's going to end up going against this chick's homeowner's insurance for the owner of the Rottweiler who attacked my wife and my, my, uh, and Ned. So, yeah, but yeah, I know. I'm like, hey, do you want this added on? I'm right now. I'm like, yeah, sure. Go. <laughs> But if I was, if I didn't have that, I would probably be a little bit more skeptical. But yeah, I hate that, man. I hate that it's a commercial enterprise. But it's, but it's your dog, and they got you. Emotionalism. There you go, man. I will fucking do anything for Ned. You name it, I'll do it for him. People are weirded out by that too. Uh, one of the best shows I've seen from you today. Thank you, thank you, Rolla, for your. You know what? Here, you get one too. Down the Marco. One of the best shows I've ever seen today. Uh, thank you, Roll, for your service for all for all men around the world. I salute you from Montreal. Montreal. <laughs> Are my golden knights going up there? Uh, keep up the good work. Here's oh your tip for Ned. Thank you. It will most definitely go to his fund. Um, 
Give the dog a bone. Thank you for that. I appreciate you, Rusty. Uh, what do you got here? Rolo, uh, will an ex ever realize what she lost on a man whom she left retrospectively? Yes. Uh, a man who was alpha and became beta. Oh, a man who was alpha and became beta. Do they act on these? Okay. Um, if the guy is alpha and he stays alpha, yes. If he is beta and becomes alpha, more alpha, more alpha. And again, I'm using these as abstractions. Okay. These are not like definitive terms. Um, yes. If the guy was alpha and then he became beta. Mm, questionable. I don't know. Do they act on these? Well, let's see. I have. Where did it go? This was a long time ago. Just to uh, give you a a point of reference. Oh, this was 2016. My bad. Uh, here, this is how I know. Chrome tab. Uh, where is it? Where are you? Oh, plan B. There we go. This is how I know. Plan B. <laughs> I just wanted to show you the, the the meme right there because this is as far this is this just got reheated not too long ago. Uh, the plan B. Plan B. Two thousand female two thousand female respondents. This was one poll. By the way, they've done this uh, uh, several times since twenty sixteen. This was the first time I was aware of it. The plan B. 2,000 females, 43% have a backup man if current relationship ends. Eight out of 10 are in touch with the backup man. 15% said their feelings were stronger for the backup man. Fifth, the backdoor man. 50% uh, said their partner was aware. Of, half of them were aware of the backdoor, of the backdoor man, the backup man. One out of five admitted backup man was a friend of their partner, and he will betray. <laughs> one out of 10 said the backup man had already confessed their undying love. Of course, that's women reporting this. Just there you go. Yeah, wrote that in 2016. Yep. Do they act on it? Mm, depends. It's like, uh, what, what did uh, Chris Rock say it was? Um, it was like, in case of in case of breakup, break glass. It's like being a dick in a glass case. Break the glass for you. Every time a man's being nice to you, all he's doing is offering dick. Yep. <clears throat> 39 year old with female employees in their 20s. Any advice on how to treat them to both want to want them to improve, but also don't want to seem beta. Thanks. Uh, improve how like to be better employees. Uh, see that. See, this is one of the problems that we have sort of in modern times. I think really it's that this is a post sexual revolution problem putting women into the workplace and then having men have to be their mentors and women have, I've, I've seen polls of this before. I, I don't have them on hand. I'm, so, I'm sorry, but women tend to uh, want to work for male supervisors instead of female supervisors. I think it's because women hate women, <laughs> but they tend to have a, to want to have a, a male as their supervisor. Same thing as like, you know, kids learn better from male teachers, although we don't have too many of them now. Um, so, uh, so, but what's the dynamic? Well, I think honestly, it comes back to like, I was reading to you guys before, uh, I think it was a couple shows ago, the big head babies theory about how, uh, you know, when men call women, uh, you know, they're just like children. They do, they don't, they don't ever mature past a certain age. Well, it's not even so much that they're necessarily children. It's just that men view them as such because there is that fragileness, that, that vulnerability, that, that, um, vul the vulnerable sex, right? that need that innate protector dynamic that is part of the male psyche. That is part of our firmware, part of our OS to want to protect women. That's where the simp vibe comes from, right? A vibe I'm using, but that's where the simp desire is to come from. It's, it's I, definitely the simps want to get laid. Don't get me wrong. They want, Oh, maybe if I do this, she'll want to fuck me. Right. It's that transactional sex. It's the savior schema, but it all that even simping is rooted in the male protector dynamic in that. If I do these things, if I perform for services rendered, if I perform these things, this woman is going to want to uh, have sex with me and, and I'll be able to solve my reproductive problem. If I'm identify with her, if I align with the feminine imperative, if I identify with the feminine, if I express myself, if I do everything that they always tell me to do, what do I have to do to get a girl? 
What do women really want? Oh, we want you to be funny and nice and cute and blah, 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 and be a good provider and be this and that. And you find you do all this stuff and you know what they really want? They want somebody to be an asshole. They want somebody to be Machiavellian. They want somebody who is who they are their own mental point of origin that women have to earn their attention. They have to earn that that love. Right. Women want to be able to look up to a guy. They want a guy that they can admire. And the guy that they can't admire is the guy who will do anything for her. <laughs> they want a guy who is like focused on his mission is what they really want. Oh, they're not all like that. Yeah, well, the ones you want are. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, man. Here we go. Uh, Johnny Rico on Marxism and relationships. Lots of men in relationships need sex and women are able to provide it to, to provide it determine that okay, transactional uh, determining something is a need only happens when it serves those who hold the power. Marxism guided by feminism, uh, by feminine imperative. Right. I, I get you. In fact, here you can have this. Thank you, Johnny. Johnny Rico. 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 <sighs> Roughnecks. By the way, somebody gave me the uh, gave me an, uh, a, a, a link to uh, getting those dog tags for Rolo's Roughnecks, and I am going to do them. <laughs> I just I've been looking into I'm trying to find a way. I was at first I wanted to make them customizable so you could get your own names on them. I don't know if I can actually do that with these guys, but I am going to produce a bunch of uh, uh, dog tags for the Rational Mail. I think that would be that would definitely be the first thing I want to do for merch. <laughs> but I got I have a line on a on a on a supplier now, so. Uh, but yeah, as far as uh, is the Marxism side of things is now, the reason why I say this is, is an e egalitarian marriages, the idea that we need to be in a 50 50 equal partnership. That flies in the face of, well, it's, you don't want to be patriarchal, do you? It's not patriarchal. It's conventional, you know, fundamental gender roles is what it is. It's men, the protector dynamic, as I was saying before. When you are in an egalitarian relationship, the gendered protection dynamic only works one way. Who's going? Like, yeah, I love this one, right? This is a, the, you've heard this example a million times <clears throat> from Myron or from, from uh, Andrew Tate of all people, right? You know, if there's an intruder in the house, who's going downstairs with a baseball bat or a gun or whatever else? I don't care what the weapon is. Okay. Who's going? Husband or wife? Yeah. All that 50 50 bullshit that flies right out the fucking window. Because there ain't no Marxism, there ain't no egalitarianism when the shit hits the fan. So, yeah, but the the idea that, it, again, a 50-50 partnership between women and egalitarian marriage is a luxury belief of the 20, really 20, 20th and 21st century right now. We can afford it right now. We can afford the bullshit. Women can afford to be entitled and hubristic, and they can afford to <clears throat> expect 20th century responsibilities from men while also expecting 21st century response or 21st century uh, authority for themselves. That's really the difference between those two. It's wanting, it's wanting your cake and eating it too with sprinkles. Rational trucker. Everyone uses the term friends loosely to describe almost everyone uh, like th they like to socialize with. I will classify friends with a capital F, lowercase friends. Yeah, females are, women are lowercase friends. Okay. Got it. <clears throat> I mean, there's, a, I mean, I really love the girls that I love my sister wives. Okay. And I joke, they're not actually my sister wives, right? But if I take a lot, if I take a, I take a Shannon to you, I'll call you my sister wife. Like Maya is a sister wife, icy sister wife. Tiffany, yeah, she's a sister wife. Uh, Torsha, sister wife. If I if I if I really like you and I call you a sister wife, you know it's 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 on. Uh, let's see, got it, got it, got it. Okay, good enough. Now here's the next thing I want to get to. This is the this is the this is the second article that kind of set me off. I got a video to respond to here in just a second, but I wanted to get. I, I would be remiss if I don't put this up because this is really what set me off. It set me off. Uh, Chris Williamson of all people, of course, of course, it's Chris who sets me off. All right. This, you want to talk about grade a simping, pandering, pussy ass shit. This is it right here. And I, I, I feel no compunction about like saying this about the guy. <clears throat> Never be vulnerable in front of your girlfriend is a, is common manosphere advice. Well, first off, it's not advice. But let's continue. The guy I was talking to is more alpha than pretty much every other human that's ever existed. He never knows. He never mentions throughout this thing who he's talking about. 
And yet he told me a story of how he sobbed on the bathroom floor in his girlfriend's arms when the pressure got too much for him. Uh, okay. Uh, then he got up, dusted himself off and went out to dominate his challenges, his challenges, unnamed challenges and became become and become a world champion. This is what, this is what makes me think he didn't write this. There's, there's subtle little things in like AI that I, I'm starting to pick up on. Like this could be like an AI chat bot, but here, let's just, we'll pretend he's, this is legit. Here's the thing. Hiding your vulnerability from the world doesn't make you any less vulnerable. It just makes you less honest. Um, no, no, it actually doesn't. In fact, if anything, being in control of your emotions makes you more honest, especially as a guy. Why, children? Hello there, children. Why, children? How's it going? Because men and women are fucking different. Our brains are not the same. Our architecture is not the same. We are not wired the same. Chris Williamson. There you go. Uh, keep going down. Here you go. Don't you don't change the way you feel, 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 feel by hiding your feelings from the world. OK, limits on speech are just limits on sincerity like this is create a prime copy AI bullshit. If I were to go to copy AI and I would say, you know what, copy AI, I really need a big, nice viral tweet on vul male vulnerability. Can you write me one? Sure thing. Hold my beer. This is what would be the this was what, what would be the result. See, I don't I honestly don't think this is Chris doing this. I think it's his it's his PR company that's actually throwing this out there. I doubt he would cop to this. If you believe that being vulnerable makes you a pussy, how do you how do you arrive at the conclusion that feeling vulnerable and also not being able to open up about it uh, somehow makes you less of a pussy? Well, because that's not the motivate. That's not the impetus. Because women don't want to hear about your bullshit. They don't care about your problems. What do you want, Mr. Mind? Oh, Jesus Christ, dude. Really, again, with the Lisa Sparks thing. I don't even know who the fuck Lisa Sparks is. Is she a porn star? She's not my porn. I don't, I don't fucking, I don't ride with that, dude. Sorry, bro. Trollbot. Trollbot, smash it. Thank you. Let's play whack-a-mole. Uh, continuing on. There we go. Uh, never be vulnerable in front of your girlfriend. Okay, so uh, if you believe that being vulnerable makes you less of a makes you a pussy, all how do you arrive at the conclusion that feeling vulnerable, feeling vulnerable, and also not being able to open up about it somehow makes you less of a pussy? Okay, I, feeling vulnerable, feeling vulnerable. Usually, it's not a feeling of vulnerability. It's a feeling of frustration. It's a feeling of being pissed off. It's a feeling of being out of control. That's what it is. It's not a feeling of vulnerability. Vulnerability is expressing it, telling somebody about it. Hey, here's my Achilles heel. Please don't fucking use it. Please, Ajax or whatever. Don't shoot me in the fucking Achilles heel. That's vulnerability. It is a chink in the armor. It is the fact that it is the, the, the avenue into which you can hurt somebody. It is not the actual thing that you're talking about. Is not the actual, uh, I lost my job. I've got a big old goiter on my fucking neck. Uh, I'm losing my hair. I've got genital warts. Some, whatever it is, right? Here's my vulnerable. This is why I feel vulnerable. I get, no, no. What we're just saying, like, I love it when we have to talk about, like, how we need a male influence in young men's lives. And every time like they do, they do some sort of criminal act or they try to commit, they attempt suicide or they're a drug addict or they end up in jail or whatever the fuck it is. The first thing we do is you say, where's the man? He needs a strong masculine influence in there and blah, blah, blah. So he can get in control of his emotions. What the fuck? Like make up your goddamn mind. Oh, you need to be more vulnerable, blah, 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 blah. Fuck you and your vulnerability. The reason why people think that guys need to be more vulnerable, well, first of all, it's it's what uh, this is Jack Donovan, by the way. It's what's known as transvaluation. Transvaluation is a technique. It's more gaslighting, really, but it's a it's a technique that is used to convince people that whatever they think is is a, a, a is pro is 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 a, is a pro something. It becomes a con, right? 
it's like whatever the opposite of a word is means the opposite of it, right? So strength is actually weakness. Weakness is actually strength. Vulnerability is not actually a vulnerability. It's actually a strength. And if you're more vulnerable, then women will like you. Well, guess what you're doing? You're pandering to women. You are aligning yourself and identifying with the feminine. You are a cussle fish, Chris Williamson, amongst other things. And men aren't saying, oh, don't be vulnerable. Oh, if you don't, like, no one is saying that, dude. We're, we're saying you need to be in control of your emotions, which, by the way, I'm sure he's probably said a million times to Jocko Willink, Willink, which I'm sure he said to all these really, you know, these positivity hustlers all the fucking time. Well, what's how do we how do we get these uh, these uh, dropout generation of boys back on the saddle, Jordan Peterson? How do we get these guys to 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 man up and take responsibility? Right. Well, you know, they got to really be in control of their emotions. They really got to get things, you know, hunker down and sack up and bootstraps, bootstraps, bootstraps. Right. Oh, but be vulnerable at the same fucking time. <sighs> Again, well, well, I'm going to continue here. We'll keep going. Uh, if your concern is that your partner will lose respect for you if she sees you being vulnerable, then one of two things is true. Oh, thank you. So here's your categories because human beings love categories and they love lists too. Number one, your partner is incapable of having an emotionally open, mature relationship. And it's a massive red flag. What the fuck is an emotionally open, mature relationship? Like explain to me the factors involved in healthy. Emo and I will, if, and you know what they probably could And every single one of those factors and those attributes will be nothing but pandering to a female experience guaranteed whenever we talk about like, Oh, you need to express yourself. You can get in touch with your feminine side. You need to be more vulnerable. That all that does is put men in the position of qualifying for for women's approval. I can experience life more like a woman than this guy. Can. It's, it becomes a, 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 a competition for guys. I can out emote this guy. So therefore I'm the better guy for a better candidate for you to have a baby with. No. <laughs> and then of course what happens Women want the guy who's like, looks, looks like Jason Momoa and has like dark triad personality traits. <laughs> no, what, like, what is that? What constitutes that? And I guarantee if you ever even got a definition of that, it will be whatever serves the female imperative. Garen fucking teed it. Number two, your masculinity fundamentally rests on a fragile foundation. A single display of vulnerability is sufficient to push it over the edge. No, no, it's not. Because masculinity is not an act. It is a personality attribute, a conventional mass. There are conventionally masculine attributes that men have that are part of our biology. It's part of how we evolved is part of like the things that we like men from, from all over the society, from different societies, all ethnicities, all cultures. There are certain aspects of masculinity that are universal are conventional. It is not an act. And this was one of the things that I wrote about way back in, I think it was my second book. It was a vulnerability. It was actually called vulnerability. And the reason why I, I drew attention to it is because there was a push during that time that probably still going on right now to convince people, convince men, especially that masculinity was an act, that it was a role, that it was, it was a LARP. It was a uh, play acting. And if you were real, if men could just like let the facade down and be vulnerable, and if men could just let go of this macho bullshit that they're taught by society because it's all social constructionism, if men could just let that go, we could perfect men. Okay, well, what would those perfect men look like? Women. That's what they would look like. They would be emoting like women. They would be experiencing things like women. They would have a, a filter through which they would view life and interpret their surroundings with that would be identical to the female experience. Guess what? We're not wired that way. We're Oh, they'd all be crying at the end of Titanic. Yeah, guess why we don't? We're not, not because we're emotionally stunted. It's because we just don't do that. We're different than you are. It has nothing to do with emotional security. It has nothing to do with, uh, you know, oh, your masculinity is based on a single display of vulnerability. No. Okay. Your internal fear. I love this fear. Okay. Notice how this is everything in this whole diatribe is in, this is the language of emotionalism. So we can pick out all of these. I mean, hell, they use the term emotional in all this stuff. 
But if you look at this here, like I love this, your internal fear, which is an emotion, is the is that you are inherently unlikable. Mm, OK, so that might be emotional and that you're one wrong move away from being friend zoned. Yeah, because it's happened often enough to enough guys that people are guys are wary of that. But it also might not be. It also might be that we just simply don't have the fucking hardware. That doesn't sound very high value. Okay, so now you're insecure if you're not vulnerable. Insecurity is, by definition, vulnerability. <laughs> is it possible that you have such a low opinion of your, of women and youth and think they can't be trusted to help you when you're vulnerable? Then women are going to sense that you in, that in you and respond appropriately. Yes, yes, they are. Because that's the way they're wired. They want protection, provisioning, and parental parental investment. They want a guy who has a capacity for violence. Just ask your good friend, Jordan Peterson. Those guys aren't crying on the bathroom floor. Those guys are out there take, taking scalps. Those guys are out there slitting throats, and then maybe they can change the baby afterwards. Thank you, Justin Waller, for that, that visual. <laughs> yeah. So make up your fucking mind. Who do you agree with? You agree with Jordan Peterson? You gotta have a men need to be dangerous men, but they also gotta be vulnerable. So, but what the fuck? What do they have to be? Where where are they gonna be at? Now, here I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this out there because I just saw this here a second. Vulnerability is pounced on. Women can't be secure with a guy who cries all the time. Right. The problem with the vulnerability bullshit is that guys wear it like a badge. It is a point of pride. I can be vulnerable. I'm not like other guys because I can be vulnerable with you. I can cry on demand. Oh, I just hated it when that, when at the end and Jack slid down to the bottom of the ocean after Titanic and it was just, so, it was heart wrenching. I'm feeling vulnerable. Hold me. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> What was it? When Captain Miller dies in, in Saving Private Ryan. Yeah, it was really emotional. <laughs> it is. It's all. Thank you. Where is it? Wait a minute. Wait, stop there. It's all bullshit. It is all bullshit. But it's bullshit that's being sold and repackaged by grifting hustlers like Chris Williamson right now. Now, I've said this before. I will say this one more time. I actually mentioned this in the essay that I wrote about vulnerability long before, well, long before Chris Williamson was on what total drama Island or whatever the fuck show he was on. <laughs> um, in that essay, I mentioned this, I said, there's still a utility in being vulnerable for guys whose predominant character is alpha. If you're the kind of guy who doesn't, wear his emotions on his sleeve. If you're the kind of guy who's, I hate to use the word stoic because it sounds like LARPing, but if you're a guy, for lack of a better term, if you're a stoic guy who's more, uh, let's see, uh, mental point of origin, you're your mental point of origin and not, not much affects you. Like you're, 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 you're the rock, man. You're, I don't mean the rock. I mean, you're the, the lighthouse in the storm, right? You're the guy who's whose emotions are very much measured and you're the guy that can be looked to, to be dependable on. And you are the guy who, you know, they're not very emotional. And when you are emotional, it's usually anger. Like guys express emotion all the time. It's usually just anger. That's our, dis our men's default, angry, pissed off. It's not, ooh, ooh, ooh. women cry, men get pissed. That's, I think that's probably one of the bigger, the bigger issues right there. Like when women cry, men will come to their, oh, what's wrong? What's wrong? The baby's crying. Oh, what's wrong with the baby? Men cry. Uh, you're a liability. You start crying. You can no longer defend the tribe. You can no longer defend. If, if you have, if you're, if you're, if your uh, default emotion is tears, you're her girlfriend <laughs> because that's because it's, it's an innate proclivity. That's why you have to learn to cry on demand. You have to like men out. Well, you got to teach men to be more in touch with their emotions. Yeah. That's the problem. So if you're the guy who is mostly alpha all the time, you're alpha and you are, you, like I said, you're the dependable guy. Then when you do show some flash of emotion, 
some small vulnerability. Women love that. Absolutely love that. And that's where this gets misconstrued. If your predominant personality characteristic is to be more, more, uh, more alpha, then when you do show one moment, one, like your, your dog, God knows I almost lost Ned, right? That one moment when your dad dies or your, your, your mom dies or whatever, your kid dies, well, God forbid, right? But like something happens in your life where it's like you were just overcome with emotion and you don't know what to do. That is the point where that woman goes, he's usually not like this. I'm the only one that can drag it out for him. I'm the only one that's here. I'm the only one he'll cry in front of because it becomes this ego appeasement. It becomes this association. Well, it's beauty and the beast, right? He's, he's this son of a, he's this hairy fucking beast. And he's just like, he's, he's just his, like he's a, this big fucking bear with these big fucking claws. right? And only she can draw that out of him then yes, then vulnerability will work. But not if that big beast is a blubbering, crying idiot and that's his default setting. He can use the example of this dude who's crying on the bathroom floor. Well, you know, then he went out and challenged. He became a world champion. What? I don't know. But let's just say for sake of argument, he's correct. Yeah, the reason why that was m remarkable is probably because that guy his predominant characteristic. As he said, he's the most alpha guy I know. Yeah, that's why it was appreciated. <laughs> if it's a guy that looks like destiny, he's blubbering his eyes out all the time and that's his default setting. He's a fucking wimp. He is a pussy at that at that point. That's the dynamic you're missing there. But once again, I, I'll stop sharing this right now because I don't want to put that whole thing on you guys. So if your predominant character is alpha, then yes, vulnerability will be uh, will be appreciated by women, but up to a point. Because if you keep doing that, if, you, if you're this alcoholic piece of shit and you're you're crying on demand, I don't know what to do in my life. Oh, I'm vulnerable. Help me. She's like, get the fuck. I'm gone. Bye. Bye, bitch. <laughs> Wait here. Hold on. Bye, Felicia. There you go. <laughs> yeah, she's out. I don't care if you think you're a pussy or not. You know, her being there and her not being there is has nothing to do with you, like whether you think you're a pussy or you're not a pussy or you're how how legitimate your masculinity is. The fact of the matter, the empirical fact is she ain't there and you are. <laughs> That's how it works. Uh, let's see. Uh, I follow the red pill of truth, manosphere on uh, on and on and off for uh, short of a decade. I have a question. Do you believe in heard of the curse of Cassandra? No. Uh, it seems people who know too much either become silent or vanish eventually. Vanish? Oh, wow. Vanish. Uh, I don't know anything about that. He chose poorly. Uh, Curse of Cassandra. Uh, Sammy, can you look that up for me? Curse of Cassandra. Now I'm, you, you piqued my interest. You had my, you had my attention. Now you, have, you had my curiosity. Now you have my attention. Uh, sorry, I got to go rip that. Oh, hey, Robert. Robert, Robert Coslin. Holy shit. Robert, I'm going to throw that on there just because I like you. Females have a have better sense of smell. They do. Oh, read, uh, read that it was tied to recognition of offspring. Yeah, I think so. Because they have to smell out pathogens, I think. Old data that may well be inco incorrect or incomplete. Oh, yeah, I, I want to see some. I want to see if that's actually legit because I have my suspicions that that's actually how it is. I could be wrong. But if it's pro, if, if it means that women can actually smell better than men, you bet there's probably like a dozen different studies out there. Here they are. We're better at this. Here's something we're better at. Trust me. Uh, for the six million dollar dog, we can rebuild him. We have the technology to create the first bionic dog. He pro probably is better, stronger, faster. I don't know if he'll be faster. I hope he's faster. So, Molly Smash. Holy shit. Every man has a hoe, has a hoe. Otherwise, he's a simp. Yes. <laughs> oh, Molly, here, here, I got another one for you, Molly. Every man wants a slut. He just wants her to be his slut. <laughs> uh, let's see. Back it up, back it up, back it up. Six million dollar dog. He is. He's the bionic dog. We need a, we need a TV trailer for Ned. I should post a picture of him. He's doing, he's doing okay. Okay, I got you. Got to you. Got to Sam Whiskey. Did I get Sam Whiskey? Yeah, I did. Um, moving along, moving along. Sorry, it's not starring these things automatically. I don't know why. 
Oh, that to you. Thank you very much for your contribution. Dr. Orion Taraban mentioned on FNF, there is research showing that women use emotional vulnerability against men at a later date. Intimate partner abuse. Yeah, it can be. Yeah. Remember when you were, remember when you were crying on my shoulder? Like, yeah. You mean, so using it sort of as like a, a chip, like calling in a chip, like, like the, we're going to use this later. Like I know, I, I know how to hurt you because I saw you when you're at your weakest moment. Yeah, I, I understand that. I, I don't, how common, maybe Dr. Dr. Orion Taraban knows more about that than I do. I don't know if, he, does he have a, is Dr. Orion Taraban in his own private practice? Does he, makes the rounds quite, like so much, I would wonder if he actually does. Uh, Viking, uh, Viking paradigm, yeah, women just want uh, the weak man, aka the cuttlefish uh, men to snitch on themselves so they don't need to waste more time. It's in their DNA. Yeah, it is. Uh, that's a good, uh, that's a good observation. Um, is vulnerable, is male vulnerability a shit test? Are you going to knuckle under? That goes back to, um, let's you and him fight. You guys know what I'm talking about with let's you and him. it's a dynamic. By the way, it was, this was like called out by a pickup artist a long time ago. Let's you and him fight is a shit test or it's a dynamic that, that women will use to test to see if that guy is who he really is. Like if a woman like sort of gets with the guy, oh, this is my boyfriend, right? You'll, sometimes you'll see women who are not, they don't have a solid attachment, right? They don't have a, a healthy attachment to the boyfriend. They, these are the guys who will, um, geez, I can't believe I'm going to say this. Um, these are the guys who, uh, who that woman just simply does, like he's not the best I can do. Like the hypergamous doubt gets the best of her. So there has to be this test to see, is, is he really, is he not? And usually what happens is then women will instigate situations, a conf conflict situations where that guy will have to deal with the conflict that she generated. Like she'll go talk shit to somebody, like somebody, like maybe it's at a club, maybe it's a bouncer, maybe it's just somebody in a park or some shit like that, whatever, just to give them shit because she's with you and she knows that you're going to have to be the one to settle the conflict that she started. And I, I really need to do like a full dedicated show about this because I mean, I think there's a lot, there's a lot there, but the old school pickup artists used to call this let's you and him fight. And so it was, if you had a girlfriend or you had this girl that was like, you know, one of your, one, of, one girl that was in your rotation, that girl or that woman would try to initiate some shit. You talk some shit, right? Hoping that your capacity for violence would surface so she could know whether or not you're a, you're a pussy, right? Whether or not she's with the guy who's the best that she can do. Will you defend me? Will you protect me? Will you kick this guy's ass? Well, I can't sit around and wait for a, an organic moment of conflict. So I'm going to go and instigate one myself to see if you're really the shit or you're not. Now, in today's society, that can get kind of dangerous, especially you add alcohol and people get shot. <laughs> People get, people get knifed. People get beat the fuck up, you know, get beat down. They get put to sleep. <laughs> and that's, again, that's, that's, so is that the vulnerability side? Is that the, is that, what is that? I think that also kind of plays into the vulnerability thing. Like, well, is this guy, is this guy really who he says he is? Because, you know, this doesn't seem like that big a deal. And he's really crying his eyes out over it. Or he's had a setback. I think there's a better example than what like Chris Williamson was, was giving us here. I think a better example would have been like, I think it was Alex Hormozzi who said this is that he got to the point where one of his, one of his like first companies went bankrupt and he was like, he was feeling down about himself. He was like, I think he was not married at that time, but the girl, his wife now it was his fiance then. And he said something like, you know, if you leave me now, I will totally understand. Like he was, he was like really upfront and like logical, pragmatic about the whole thing. He said, I understand. He's like, I, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. If you want to leave, fine. And then of course she says, oh, pff, it's, you, you got zeroed out. You're going to come back, blah, blah, blah. She stuck with him. And that was like the, the virtue signaling, right? That was the, 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 uh, the buildup to all of it. But the, the fact of the matter is, is like his first inclination, even Al Tormozzi was like, you know, if you leave, I got it. I, I totally understand. I get what you're saying. Right. So in that sense, in that instance, like I, I get it. Like the guys want to want to give up like, guys who just sort of like want to give up on themselves or they get depressed. Like guys are not allowed to get depressed around women, period. End of story. Competence is a key attraction cue for women and vulnerability, even flashes of vulnerability are signs of incompetence, failure, incompetence. But we're humans. We should be able to. Yeah, we are. But we're also 
machines. We're also like, there's still that tribalistic nature. Like this guy's a liability. You want to know why when women make more money than a guy, like they're in a marriage and like the woman gets a promotion or something, she make, starts making more money than the guy. And that is the precursor to divorce. That's because it implies incompetence. I'm going and I'm surrounded by guys who are more competent than the guy that I'm with right now and equal partner or not. He's no longer an equal partner if she's making more money because her hind brain, her lizard brain, as we were saying before, and her emotional brain, too, I'm, I'm sure, looks at him as a liability. Would women say, oh, men are just big children after all? You know that. Yeah, well, they look at you that way because now those children, because what are children? They're dependents. They're liabilities. <laughs> uh, if she knows you are emotionally vulnerable, she will start to use the kid against you in divorce court, of course, to extort more, mo extort more money out of the husband. Yeah, well, that's, you know, you, you suddenly become the biggest dick in the world at that point. Okay. Uh, what else do I have here? Um, ah, man, I got this research article, sex differences in the structural connectome of the human brain. I have article after article. I'm just like, do I want to read these? Uh, gender agenda. Men and women are born to be different as experts prove brain differences begin in the womb. This is from 2019. That was a good one, too. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find one that's not like as long for you guys, but you get the idea. Oh, this is good. I, I, I brought this up. I, you know, I, uh, I, I, I wanted to throw this one out here sort of at the end of that last video where the guys were talking about love. Uh, it, it's in the, the show with all the, with, the, with the black guys and the women, the black women in the, in the audience. I, I really wish I remembered the name of that show because I keep using that as a reference all the time. But the uh, the idea of like who says who says you know who's in love and who's not like guys guys are t men by lar by by far are the ones who are the first ones to say I love you first uh, simply because they're motivated to do so most guys live in a state of sexual deficit and if they can consolidate on a woman by saying that they're in love they will but I'm going to refer I'm just going to read this to you this is off of uh, Royce's Royce's R O I S S Y uh, you can find this at hartiste.org in fact you know what let me just share the screen uh, this is a good one there we go this is at hartiste throw that up there for you I'm just going to read the first one off of this. Never say I love you first. Women want to, I, maybe I'll read some other. <laughs> Never say I love you first. Women want to feel like they have to overcome obstacles to win a man's heart. They crave the challenge of capturing the interest of a man who has other women competing for his attention and eventually prevailing over his grudging reluctance to award his committed exclusivity. The man who gives his emotional world away too easily robs women of the satisfaction of earning his love. Though you may be in love with her, don't say it before she has said it. Show compassionate restraint for her need to struggle towards yin fulfillment, like yin yang, yin fulfillment. Inspire her to take the leap for you, then she'll return the favor a thousandfold. This is why you don't say, I love you first. Uh, and there was the other one. Where's the, um, don't play by her rules. Oh, this is a good one too. Uh, make her jealous. That's always good. Yeah. You shall make your mission and not your woman, your priority. Forget all of those romantic cliches of the leading man proclaiming his undying love for the woman who completes him. Despite what, uh, what, uh, whatever protestations to the contrary, women do not want to be the one or the center of a man's existence. They, in fact, want to subordinate themselves to a worthy, worthy, worthy man's life purpose to help him achieve that purpose with her feminine support and to follow the path he lays out. You must respect a woman's integrity and not lie to her that she is your everything. She is not your everything. And if she is, she will soon not be anymore. And then lastly, uh, don't play by her rules. If you allow a woman to play by the, to make the rules, she will resent you with a seething contempt even a rapist cannot inspire. The strongest woman and the most strident feminist want to be led, uh, led by and submit to a more powerful man. 
Polarity is the core of a healthy, loving relationship. I'm going to read that again. Polarity is the core of a healthy, loving relationship, not 50-50 equal partnership. She does not want the prerogative to walk all over you with her capricious demands and mercurial moods. I love his language. Her emotions are a hurricane, her soul a saboteur. Think of yourself as a bulwark against her tempest. Remember what I said, you got to be the rock. When she grasps for the pillar uh, to steady herself against the whipping winds or yearns for authority, an authority figure to foil her worst instincts, it is you who has to be there, strong, solid, unshakable, and immovable. This is why you don't go with that vulnerability game. And that's what it is. And that's really what, what when, when it boils down to it, like, oh, man, you men aren't insecure for being vulnerable. No, yeah, they are insecure for, they're insecure for expressing that vulnerability. Men are going to be vulnerable. You're going you're gonna to feel like self-doubt. You're, you're going to get zeroed out as a guy. You'll probably get zero. I've been zeroed out. I am 55 years old. I've probably been zeroed out at least four or five, like majorly, probably about four or five times in my life and come back from all of them. And that's really the definition of a guy. And you know what? You don't get pat on back for it. Women don't care about your struggles. They wait at the finish line and they fuck the winners. And those winners aren't crying about their, their previous struggles because they're capable. They're competent. Vulnerability is a cue, is a sign of incompetence. That's why it's not your, your pussy. Every guy goes through like moments of doubt and moments of like failure and gets zeroed out. That doesn't make you a pussy. Talking about it, like to your to your to your significant to your to your wife or your girlfriend. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. That's that's like the last thing women want to say because they look to you for long term security. They're with you at least in part, and probably in a major part, because at some point along the way, you seemed like a pretty good bet for her long term security. And here you are saying, I don't know if I can take care of you. Like, and maybe you're not putting it into those words, but that's what her lizard brain. This brain right there, that's what the auto, that's what autopilot is picking up. <laughs> She's picking up what you're laying down. You don't want the lizard brain to, uh, to think that you're incompetent <laughs> because that's where all the rest of this starts emotions and then reason. That's the, that's the primary difference right there. All right, let me get to comments here real quick. I got, a, I got one more uh, video we need to get to. Uh, I lived the let's you and him fight for almost 10 years. Yeah. And if they, if you don't answer that decisively, it will continue in your case for 10 years. I found your work role. You saved my LTR from my own shortcomings and she is still with me and happy now. Great. You know what, Viking? Why don't you broadcast that to fucking uh, to Twitter? So I don't have to hear these dumb bitches telling me about like, oh, the red pill is going to ruin your marriage. The red pill is going to ruin your life. Fuck you. Show me where it is. Show me because I can show you dozens, thousands, hundreds and thousands of guys testimonials over the course of 20 fucking years saying that the red pill, like your story, like saying the red pills improve their lives. And here I got some little kid. Here's some 22 year old cunt. That's like, oh, yeah, uh, what well, you know, it's uh, the red pills poisonous. Da, 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 da. You have no idea what you're talking about. Absolutely no idea what you're talking about. God, it drives me insane. I'm having an emotional response. I'm having an emotional response. It's anger. Anger. Okay. Did I get to you? Uh, let's see. <laughs> All right. Got to that. Got to that. Got to that. What was this one? Uh, if she knows you are emotionally vulnerable, she will start to use. Okay. I already got to you. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, I don't know why it's not auto starring. It was before. Maybe I missed a setting or something before I launched the show. All right. Um, let me, I've got some really good stuff here now. And here comes the fun part, children. Um, where is it? I got some good stuff today for you. Um, God, do I really want to put that one on? Yeah. There's, there's parts of these that I want to like, I want to like scrub through to get to these things for you. Oh God. Okay. 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 Is this the one? This might be it. Is this the Matt Walsh one here? 
one of the things that happens with a lot of women, you know, women are, are in many ways dominated by their emotions, right? Men, no, men are men absolutely are the dominated. Same way. Us, but we, we are, but like, it's like, equal. Uh, one of no, no, they're not. Women's default is to the emotional. Men's default, like untrained, unconditioned, is to the rational and the reasoning. That's why you get responses from Melina and Destiny. Because their per, their main premise. Oh, hey, wait. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Stop, stop. There. Guilty, 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 guilty. Oh yeah. <laughs> Thank you, PB. Love you. Love you like a brother. No homo. <laughs> uh, single moms tend to get pregnant by chads by their in their twenties, uh, but emotionally abusive with a beta provider in their thirties. Is this evidence of dual mating? Yes, it is. Um. And it's also, uh, it also shows, it's also a, the source of shit testing too, as we were saying before. I've got some things in the works. Stay tuned. Okay, cool. And happy wife, happy life. I will never be where I am without my wife. Yeah, great. Chase. Yeah, Chase. Did he say that? Was that actually him verbatim? By the way, happy wife, happy life is an ultimatum, Chase, if you're watching. The thing, one of the things that you hear very often happens in marriages is like, you know, there will be a bit of tension. Maybe the guy gets fired from his job. He's having a, a tough time finding a new one. He loses some of his confidence. You know, she's like kind of got the ick from her husband for a bit. And then like some Chad comes into the picture and he's like, hey, and he talks to her right. And then boom, she cheats. It happens all the time. I've no, seen, hold on. I've heard it a million times. Men cheat but, more but than you, women. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so you, you can, you can yeah. apply. Actually, that's statistically incorrect. It depends on the uh, it's true. If you take women in aggregate, if you go from every demographic from like, say, 18 all the way up to like, what, 70 years old, like because they they'll track up to that high. Right. Then, yes, men cheat more than women over the course of a lifetime. But if you go into demographics and you go from the 18 to 29 demographic, women cheat as much or more than men do. Got those, got those stats on tap. You can, apply it, reasons, you can apply it to both sexes, though. Sure. What I'm talking about, you can apply it to both sexes. And at that point in time, your history, your foundation doesn't matter. It all goes out the window the second that emotion. Sure, but that would be the, the case mix. whether or not we were open or closed. Yeah. Right? If I lose all my confidence and I turn into a fucking loser and I just start smoking weed all day and play League of Legends, it's not like I'm going to rely on my monogamy to keep her trapped also, in the I house. Also, I feel like, like it kind of helps like, having an open relationship, too, because you actually get to, like, taste the things that you're interested in that might not be like a relationship you know like you live with them or you want to have a future with them right but is that sustainable do, yeah, yeah, do yeah, you yeah, guys, yeah, yeah. Guys, thank you well i'm a whore yeah. Wait, don't we have the longest relationship at this table so far <laughs> you yeah. do you do but sure. but like do you guys have a high not anymore high degree of confidence that your marriage will last for decades i mean yeah. i married her without a prenup so i <laughs> hope so <laughs> okay where else this motherfucker is gonna be <laughs> hey guys it's your girl um, melanie and what you oh, see on this sorry i'll go I'm not, that's where i wanted to stop it this is from this is actually her her stream i thought it was funny because everybody has an opinion on this and i mean everybody has an opinion on this however case in point proving my point once again <laughs> Let's be vulnerable. <laughs> Let's talk about her feelings. <laughs> mm. <laughs> oh man, uh, I gotta pull this up for you too. Gosh, I, I I meant to grab this. I meant to do a screen grab of this before I started. Let me see if I can grab it real fast here. Oh god, uh, god, this is so funny. Uh, no, 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 not that one. Not that one. Here we go. Oh boy, you ready for this? I knew you were. Uh, sorry, I got to import this so you can see it. Um, there it goes. And G. Is that it? That's it. Oh, boy. This. You know when they say that tweet didn't age well? <laughs> this was May 3rd, the 3rd of May of this year. Then maybe husbands should step up and not lose their wives. <laughs> You know, marriage is a two-person thing, right? If your wife is on the verge of leaving you, take some responsibility and fix your relationship. Stop blaming women for everything and learn to grow up and be a man. See, let's see, this is a thing. Guys who are cuttlefish, guys who want to identify with the feminine, you live by that and you die by that. You live by the feminine identification and you die by the feminine identification. That tweet did not age well. <laughs> 
Uh, I, again, I, I, I don't mean to take another victory. Well, I kind of do. <laughs> In fact, I'm going to do another one. <laughs> I will take a victory lap uh, just briefly here because it goes, it kind of fits into today's theme. So where did they put that? Uh, no, not that one. Was that it? No, no, it was this one. I think oh, I might, I, I think this is it. One of the things that happens with a lot of women. Oops, that's not it. Oh, my bad. I just got the same one again. It's in the wrong folder. Sorry. I'm a one-man show. Bear with me. Where the hell did it go? Not that. Is it this one? I think this this might be it. Is this Matt Walsh? Last week that a popular YouTuber who goes by the name Destiny is uh, getting divorced. Now... To be perfectly honest, I don't know anything about Destiny. The name sounds familiar, like someone's probably come up during this segment in the past. But <laughs> Okay, so forget it. We don't need any here anymore. I don't know much about Destiny. Then why the fuck are you talking like you have some sort of authority, Matt? I am sick of this narrative. I'm going to talk about it anyways, because I know if I do, I'm going to get click-through rate. That, why don't you, like, if you started like that, I would, be, I would have so much more, more uh, fucking uh, respect for you, Matt. I don't know much about death. Then, then shut the fuck up. I, I, I didn't say it in those words, but I said the same thing to Jedediah Bila way back in July of 2022. I don't know much about Fresh and Fit or Andrew Tate or that. But here, let me tell you for the next 45 minutes what they're all about. You do not. Are you not listening to yourself? Are you like if you're going to preface it that way? All this is is just like. A caveat. Well, I'd, so he can come back and say, well, I didn't really remember. I said at the beginning, I didn't really know all that much about it. I couldn't him. tell you much about him. What I do know is that apparently. But now I'm going to say for the next 15 minutes, everything I know about him. His wife is leaving him. And I also know that by his own uh, admission, he had been in an open marriage, quote unquote. Admission. Uh, I think it was like more like evangelizing for it, but okay. here's the daily caller with the details. The wife of popular streamer and YouTuber destiny, who previously bragged about the pair's open marriage is reportedly leaving him for a man she met in Sweden. According to online reports, Screen I have to stop here. I have to, I have to do one redaction from last week's show. Cause I did not know this. So I, I will, I will admit fault. When, like I'm big enough to admit fault when I see it. People were saying like when I was, I was referring to, I don't even know the, the new guy's name, but I, I, I I did. I don't know now. Sorry. But the guy, Harry Styles, the guy who's in the dress, sitting on her lap and everything like that. People were saying, well, why, why would she be with him? Why would she get with a guy like him? He's, he's not more alpha than the destiny. Well, by order of degree, maybe, but he is, the guy has huge on TikTok. I had no idea. He's just not in our niche. Right. So he's very, he actually is pretty, a pretty big deal on TikTok. Apparently, uh, allegedly from what people have told me. Okay. That's just, that's number one. Number two is this. And I didn't point this out accurately on the last show. So I'd kind of need to sort of do a make good here is this guy for what, like, you remember, we're getting this like third hand from destiny. Destiny's going to like tell it, tell everyone and all of his followers that he's a piece of this guy. This kid's a piece of shit. Okay. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. I don't know, but that's always going to be his, his go-to anyways. But the problem that he's not seeing is like, there's a fundamental difference. He might be psychotic. He might be like manipulating her. He might be gaslighting her. Who knows? They're, everyone in this whole freaking room is psychotic. But the thing about the difference, the fundamental difference between uh, Harry Styles and, and, and Destiny, Harry Styles asked for exclusivity. He said, you're either going to divorce this guy and be with me or we're done or I'm going to kill myself or whatever the fuck he said, whatever his threat was. Like that's insecure and that's stupid and that's psychotic. Yes, I get it. It's also Machiavellian. It's also uh, uh, psychop psychopathic. It's also narcissistic. Definitely narcissistic. So you look at the MPD. If you look at the uh, the the um, sorry the uh, the uh, dark triad personality uh, traits, that kid's he's got it. <laughs> but he also asked for something Destiny never has, which was exclusivity which maybe she probably never would have given to him in the first place. Here's this other guy who's big enough on TikTok to get her attention, who has in some way en enraptured her, there's your vocabulary word, to, to want to move back to Sweden, where she's from, I believe, and move in with the guy. 
because he wants exclusivity, which was something that Destiny never pushed for at all in his his open relationship with Molina. That might be exactly what she wanted. That might be the X factor in all of this. I don't know, but it is a fundamental difference between the two of them. Shots from what appears to be messages from Destiny in a Discord channel show him complaining about his wife, Swedish internet personality Melina Gorenson, and her alleged new lover. In the leaked Discord chat, Destiny appeared to lament his wife's choice to leave him for a toxic, abusive guy. Quote, the last two months and two weeks have been a massive mind F for me, watching her become obsessed with a toxic, abusive guy. When I visited Sweden last, he gave Mel an ultimatum to divorce me and then threatened to kill himself when she didn't do it, among 20 other abusive, manipulative things he's done, and endlessly makes excuses for him, so I'm out. The uh, political YouTuber appeared to write according to the Twitter post. Now, uh, now I'm going to give you the white Christian conservative male take on all this that I just told you I know nothing about. Um, in the past, Destiny had been very open about his open relationship, appearing on different podcasts to talk about it. So but how do you know, Matt? You don't know anything about Molina and Destiny. Here he is with Lex Friedman a year or two ago. Oh, caught that one, did you? Along with his wife explaining their um, open arrangement. Watch. One interesting aspect of your relationship is you're in an open relationship. Mm -hmm. What's that like? From a game theoretic simulation perspective, what went into that calculation? And like, how does that... Like how that started or... Yeah, how did that start? Sure. Um, the only relationships I've ever done has been open relationships since I was like in high school. Yeah, because the only kinds of guys you've dated since you were in high school look like Destiny. Because I didn't really understand, like, why wouldn't you be able to, like, do other things but other people, but then just, like, have your main partner, basically? So what what is an open relationship, generally speaking? That um, means you have one like main a partner? Non-monogamous relationship. Like, you're somehow allowed, like, in different ways. Um, you can see other people sexually. Sexually. But, mm -hmm. like, there's one main Yeah, okay, uh, Or it station. doesn't have to be the first but it doesn't have to be some people, but like, <laughs> okay. I think it's probably easier and we probably don't really have time or the energy for like more than like one person to like, really like, okay, I'm done with Matt. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm real done with Matt. Cause he's just going to give, he's just going to pontificate for the next like 12 minutes on all this stuff, which you, if what you think he's going to say, he, that's what he's going to say. But I want to throw that one out there because everybody and their mother wants to clout Jack off of all of this. And, I also wanted to point out that Lex Friedman side right there, too, is because we're still trying to figure out how to do marriage, I guess. But uh, I think that when it comes to understanding instinct, emotion and reason. The thing is, is that when you when you are trying to understand, like how women sort of process emotion differently than than men do, I think one of the things is, is we live in this we live in this gynocentric social order that prioritizes the female experience and you have guys who, who buy into that. That's why I, I put those two back to back, by the way. So you've got the whatever podcast where they're saying, oh no, no, it's all about, you know, it's all about, about how we feel towards each other. It's all about, uh, you know, this mutual, it's, it's well really premised primarily on social construction, right? Well, men, men and women do the same thing. We're basically the same. No, no, we're not. And he's learning the lesson that we really aren't the same right now. I think, probably destiny's way more red pill than he wants he just doesn't want to say i'm right like he'll probably say oh, well i've always been like this like he's always been red pill fine go do you man but i think he's probably a lot more red pill than a lot of people want to give him credit for because he he acknowledges this stuff he just low-key acknowledges it because he knows if he does then people are going to pick like me are going to pick up on it um but you've got uh you've got you know you've got matt walsh pontificating on it because he's just going to tell you why it was you know not God's plan for him. So, um, where we go? Once you're alpha, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me. Once you're alpha, you never go back. Instincts have alarm bills. Women have a desire for you. Will remind you, alpha is who they are. Is who are. That's who I love the most. Don't change. Appreciate uh, its appreciation for. It. Yeah. Well, you'll see. Remember what I talk about? Like uh, the medium is the message. Women tend not to, 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 wouldn't say that. Well, I love you because you're alpha. They don't say it. They will show you that with their behavior. And so when you've got like, um, when you've got, um, when you've got somebody like Destiny and, and Melina trying to promote this idea 
of a quote unquote mutual partnership, because that's really what it is. I mean, you listen to the Lex Friedman interview. It's like, well, you know, we're free to see other people, but we're still come back to like, basically we just share a house. <laughs> Essentially, that's what it boils down to. Can you explain why it's a good idea? It's not a good idea to give your wife everything, a woman and everything. And how do you propose keeping her interested for the long haul? Oh, would you like to know? I will show you exactly how to do that. In fact, I was just about to read this anyways. Oops, I got the wrong. Hold on a second. Funny you should ask, because that is also in the 16 commandments of Poon. I am going to read to you right now. In fact, I'll just read it to you. Yeah, I'll just maybe I'll put it up here. There you go. Because I know you want to see it. I know you guys like visuals. I got one more video for you, so just hang tight. Because uh, I'm trying to get to it before the end. Uh, la, 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 la. That's, that is not it. It is this one. There you go. I'm going to answer your question. Actually, I'm not going to answer your question. Roycey is going to answer your question from what? 2019. Okay. Was it 2019? I think it was like actually before that. Okay. Here's how you do this. Here's how you keep her invested. Got it? Okay. Adhere to the golden ratio. Give your woman two thirds of everything she gives you. For every three calls or texts, give her two back. Okay, remember, this is this is practical information. This is should, okay? This, and by the way, this is Harti, this is Roycey writing this, not Rolo Tomasi. However, I do agree with it. Three declarations of love earn two in return. Three gifts, two nights out. Give her two displays of affection and stop until she has answered with three more. When she speaks, you reply with fewer words. When you, when she emotes, you emote less, not saying don't emote, got that, but you emote less. The idea behind the golden ratio is twofold. It establishes your greater value by making her chase you. And it demonstrates that you have the self-restraint to avoid getting swept up in her personal dramas, refraining from reciprocating everything she does for you in equal measure instills in her the proper attitude of belief in your higher status. In her deepest loins, it is what she truly wants. Deepest loins. There you go. Adhere to the golden mean. Adhere to the two-thirds rule. That's how you do it. Now, what I what you're getting at right now is one of the it's actually not one of my sayings. It's actually one of Pook's old school Pook. This is like back in the so suave days. Is the surest way to make a woman miserable is to give her everything she wants to give her every single thing she wants, because that'll be the first, that'll be at, the, at that point, there's nothing left. There's nothing left to, to, to go after. If you could, you know, first of all, you will never make a woman happy, period. You will make anybody happy for that matter as a male or female. Because as we said, as Nuno Betancourt, my philosopher shredder supreme has said, happiness is in the doing, not in the having, not in the getting. You can't make a woman happy, period. And that was really, I'm glad you said this at the end here, because this is really what I wanted to, to sort of like put a, put a pin at the end of this thing here is remember that happiness is a proximate outcome, not an ultimate outcome. As Nuno, the philosopher has, <laughs> has stated in this, uh, at the beginning of this show, you have, you're happy in the doing you're depressed in the doing too, by the way, it doesn't like emotion ha is meant to move you from one state to another. If you could possibly give a woman everything she ever desired, you would ruin her because there's no reason for her to move on. There's no, there's no doing. She can't be happy because there's no doing. There's no following up. There's nothing else to be done. You cannot keep a woman in a perpetual state. You can't keep anyone. You can't, keep a, you can't keep a dog in a perpetual state of happiness, contentment, because contentment is impossible for human beings. Discontent is the foundation. And discontent describes the human condition. Being discontent doesn't mean you have to, oh, this, uh, angst and everything. You don't have to apply that. What I mean is discontent defines the human condition, and that's a good thing. 
It's good to be discontent. It's exactly what Nuno was saying too. Once you get to the next plateau, once you learn this thing, once you get your degree, once you get in the, once you get a, a platinum record, once you get to where, once you get to that and you think, oh, I'll be happy when I get to this. No, you won't because the happiness doesn't come from the achievement or the trophy on your shelf or the accolades. It doesn't come from that. It comes from having done that, been in the moment when you're going from zero to <clears throat> platinum record playing you know, to a hundred thousand people at the Moscow music peace festival <laughs> or, or playing Rockville in Daytona, Florida, which is where I'd really like to get travel ascension to. Um, <clears throat> Vakin, Vakin music festival. If I get that, I'll be happy. No, I won't, but getting there, I'll be happy putting out the music, putting out the, doing what I, what I want to do, what I really like to do. Yeah, that will. And that's the problem. You want to know the most miserable women in the world? They're the happiest because they're usually on SSRIs or antidepressants because we have sold women this bill of goods and guys too, to an extent, but we've sold women this bill of goods in a gynocentric social order that happiness is some sort of sustainable state that they can achieve as long as they find the right guy or they get the right job or they get the right education or they buy the right poodle or they get the, you know, they get their business off the ground for gourmet, you know, muffins, dog biscuits, I don't know, whatever. Like then they'll be, no, you won't ladies. You will not be happy. There is no such thing as long-term security. I don't care how well off that dude is. Women marry a lifestyle. They don't marry a guy. Hopefully they fall in love with that guy later on, but they want to marry a lifestyle. At one chick that was in the in the beginning, uh, the the intro video where she's talking about like I'm not going to dress down because I'm I'm worth it. I don't want to uh, I don't want to attract the kind of guy who's not who doesn't deserve me. I, and people think oh she's hubristic and narcissistic and she is, but that mentality is indicative of discontent or the a belief set that she can be content. She won't be content. She'll never she'll never find you'll never find love, Barbie. You'll never find love. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you keep her interested? A two thirds rule, but understand. And, and women don't like the fundamental difference between men and women, as I said before, is instinct, emotion, and reason. Women prioritize emotion before reason. Men prioritize reason before emotion. That's why guys think that if they make a spreadsheet and they come up with all these brilliant ideas and these logical, empirical reasons why that woman should marry him and fuck him because he is the perfect guy and he's, he would never do these things to He's He comes from a good family and let's go, here's my spreadsheet and here's my resume for your for boyfriend ship. And she goes and she fucks Chad because no man has ever reasoned a woman into bed. He's never said, here's my spreadsheet. Well, you show up with some lingerie. I'll bring the champagne. And we'll fuck. That doesn't happen. It has to be an emotional connection. So when I'm saying, when you understand women, how do you control women emotionally? You have to understand the, how it operates, how women communicate. Everything I've said in this show up to this point so can be summed up in, well, how do I, how do I, how do I make that connection? It's not happening through reason. Most like gamma male guys, are, are just bewildered that they can't reason a woman into bed. They can't describe, they can't come up with enough proof. They can't come up with enough evidence because they're speaking the wrong language. They don't, they, they're not, they're not, they're not speaking emotionalism to women. You can still speak the language of emotionalism and still be very rational and still be very empirical. A uh, case in point, my good friend, Hotep Jesus. Hotep Jesus knows everything I do when, when it comes to like intersexual dynamics, evil bio, evil psyche, knows all that stuff. But you know what? If you ever see him in action, in Brickle, <laughs> he speaks womanese quite fluently and he knows what works. Does that mean he's selling himself out? No, it means he just understands the game. And he's playing the game. He talks to me. He, he, we can talk to shop all day long. It's like, it's this, uh, it's this right here. Where'd it go? Uh, the cartoon once again remember because motor memories are stored as implicit memories and not not declarative memories trying to use the con your conscious brain for motor task is basically accessing the wrong database you got the guy who's a very furrowed brow can you rephrase that in some mystical wisdom emotionalism can you tell that to me in the emo like this right here the because motor memories that square right there that's the empirical language of what's going on but most people don't want that they want an emotional connection. They want an emotion. They want storytelling. 
They learn better through mysticism. They learn better through metaphorical truth. They learn, it could still be true. It could still work, right? Here's how you throw a perfect punch. Well, how do I do that? Uh, be a dwell in your inner in this, right? Oh, okay. You know, like they understand it. Now, as I said before, it's like, this is the difference between metaphorical truth and actual empirical truth. The, the, the Swami telling him about motor memories and stuff like that, that's the empirical truth. The last panel in this, of course, is, you know, dwell in your, within your inner, you know, in this, right? Oh, thank you. And then they, they, that they can digest that. They can move on. Now, does that mean the Swami is being disingenuous? No, he still knows it. And he also knows that this kid has to like learn this through, you know, like namaste. <laughs> That's what women have. They have namaste. They have to speak that language. Even though you know the empirical truth, you still have to also understand that the empirical truth about women is that they prioritize emotion before reason. If you want to be successful with women, you have to accept that. You have to understand that they prioritize emotion before reason. They speak emotion before reason. You will not reason her into bed. You will not create an Excel spreadsheet that says, here's why I am the perfect boyfriend and we should get married tomorrow. Here's my resume. And guys get frustrated. Why is she fucking Chad? Why does she keep going back? They, I mean, to the point where they get black pill and they get very doomer. Yeah, I'm sure you do. I'm sure it's very frustrating because you expect them to come to your side of the table. You expect women to speak empiricism and they don't, they don't want to. It sounds bad. It's horrible. It doesn't taste good. Ro. Remember when, um, remember I told you this, uh, Michaela Peterson, by the way, by the way, Michaela, oh my goodness. I, I would be remiss if I didn't put this one up here too. Michaela Peterson. Um, let me see if I can grab, did I have her thing on here? Michaela Peterson, I would like to, um, I'm going to throw out a few things here. Uh, Michaela just gave birth to a new kid and uh, I'm trying to find the, where did it go? I'm trying to find the tweet that she put out here for it. Um, I don't know if that's it. Where did it go? Ah, there you are. Ha, got you. Gotcha. All right, here we go. This is that. This is your. This is your dessert for the end of the show. Here, oh, let me let me catch up here real fast. Hang on. Uh, la, 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 la. There we go. Uh, hate how some women want men to emote when men's default is anger, which scares the shit out of women. Yeah, you want men to be like. You need to express yourself emotionally. Okay, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> Do you think women want their feelings validated? Um. No, they don't. They want to talk about that. They want to pretend that that's the operative goal. How do you navigate those waters? Okay, so here's how I navigate those waters. And I really, one of these days, I'm just going to throw like monetization to the wind and I'm going to like put this into a video. But if you go look up, there's a really, it's a comedy video. It's a little skit. It's all about like three minutes long and it's called, It's Not About the Nail. It has this couple that are sitting on this couch. It's really well shot too. It's a pretty funny skit. And the woman is talking and complaining about like something, some ambiguous shit. She's like, you know, I've got this really big pain in my head and I just, I just don't know. It's always constantly there. And she's like, she's rambling on about this pain she has in her head and it flashes to the guy and he's looking at, you know, he's trying, he's trying to be a good listener. Right. And then it comes back to the woman, the shot comes back to the woman and she, it's kind of, she's got this big old construction nail, like, like right dead in the center of her forehead. Right. And so she's talking, you know, I just, I don't know, it's this pressure. And, I, and so she's going on and just ta venting about the, the pain she has in her forehead. And the guy's looking at the nail in her forehead and goes, you know, if we took that nail out of your head, you might feel better. You might not have you know, these, you, you might feel better, right? And the first thing I, she gets Ray outraged. She goes, it's not about the nail. Right. And so she, then she continues, why can't you guys just listen to men? They're just, you know, they don't understand. And it's a funny skit because it describes the difference in communication styles between men and women. Men, again, are more information-based, as I was saying before. It's content-based. Women is context. I feel this horrible pain in my, my forehead. It's a pressure. It's content. Feelings. Oh, I feel this horrible pain. I just don't know what to do. It's a horrible blah, blah, blah. And the guy's like, if they pulled that nail out of your head, deductive problem solving, nail, head, pull it out. Maybe things get better, right? <laughs> But she doesn't want that. She wants to have you listen to her. The enjoyment, the happiness, for lack of a better word, is inventing about 
venting her like her frustrations about the nail in her head. That is what is making. That's what gives her a purpose. That's why I said, you know, like you, to, if you want to make a woman miserable, give her everything she's ever wanted. Pull the nail out of her head. Give her everything she's ever wanted. She will hate you for that. Absolutely despise you for that. Because you've taken away a reason for her to talk, for her to to have some sort of, you know, people have a focus on her, any kind of, of, of attention, the nail in the head. If you take the nail away, the attention goes away. The drama goes away. The venting goes away. The you're not listening goes away. That enjoyment in that sitting down and talking about it, because women are context based when it comes to communication. Pull the nail out of her head. Nothing left to talk about. Content, discontent. Happiness, contentment is a proximate outcome. Discontent is, is, it defines the human condition and it works differently for men and for women. Like pull the nail out of her head. It's all over with less, what's left to talk about. Well, women want solutions too. No, no. Well, for certain things, I'm sure, but like for, for stuff like this, no, absolutely not. Uh, yes, I didn't make my woman happy. She's uh, happy as a byproduct of my higher hard work and enlightened self-interest. Yeah. And I'll tell you the other thing. Doing so makes me happy as a byproduct. Yes. And it's in the doing. I have in my first book, in the very first book, in the Rational Mail, the very first book, there you have a, a seminal chapter that was a, a derived from a blog post and that I would, took a long time developing, by the way, uh, in on the SoSwab forums. And it's called Appreciation. And just the, 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 the $2 version of it is this, is that women will, women fundamentally lack the ability to appreciate what a man does or what a man sacrifices for, to, to sustain her reality, to make, to, so that she can do what she wants to do. Women don't care about a man's struggles. They don't care about the process. They don't care about any of that kind of shit. They don't appreciate what the sacrifices a man has to make to facilitate her fucking reality. When you go, and I see this played out over and over and over again on every whatever podcast, probably doing it right now. I think they're probably live right now. Same thing over and over and over again. I don't need a man. I want a man. No, you fucking need a man. The fact is, is you don't appreciate, you have lack the, you fundamentally lack the capacity to appreciate the sacrifices men have made so you can be fly out to that fucking show. So you can use the microphone that's in front of you. So you can use the computer and the cameras and everything else. So you can sit there and bitch about how you don't need men. That's really, and that's a, that's a really kind of like graphic way of, of, of showing this in so many different nuanced ways, but you'll see it constantly. And I'll tell you, the thing is, is I, and here's what I've told, what I tell guys, it's only important to you. You have to be willing to accept the fact that they're just simply not going to get it. They don't, they don't have that appreciation. They can't. It's not in female nature to appreciate men's sacrifices because it's what you ought to be doing. Men should be responsible. Men should step up. Men should be good fathers. Men should sacrifice their lives. Men should get good jobs so that they can facilitate the realities of the, of the woman that they happen to be with. And you're never, never going to hear anything, anything to the contrary. Oh, you're such a great guy. I'm so glad I'm with you. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> so you just have to watch the behavior. You will get that appreciation, not verbally, but you will get that appreciation when she is showing it to you, when it is manifested by her behavior. And let's see, Gary Jr. Uh, anyone else like fuck this too many rules? <laughs> yeah. Well, see, uh, and and once again, thank you for proving me right here, Gary. I, and I love you like a brother, Gary. Too many rules. I don't want this. Why can't a woman just communicate like a man? Because she's a woman. And you wouldn't want it any other way. Like when people say, oh, women, women are too masculinized. They're, they just, they're, they're alpha females. Yeah. And you just don't have the patience to deal with her as a feminine female. Because that's how they communicate and that's how it works. They love drama. Drama makes women feel alive. Indignation makes women feel alive. If you don't believe me, just go and look at the 28th season of The Fucking Bachelor. <laughs> they love drama. They love indignation. There's a reason why that's the longest running show on ABC. <laughs> it hit on a formula that all women love. 
Not all women are like that. Yeah, all women are like that. Definitely. <laughs> Generations of women are like that. <laughs> I don't care what Jordan Peterson says. Well, when they get older, they become less naive. Mm, yeah, ask Tinder Swindler if they're less naive when they're older. Fucking idiot. Uh, let's continue. Do I have one more thing here for you? I uh, got to that. Oh, men's emotions. Here's a good one. I, I wanted to throw this last year. We're living in a time, I don't even know who this chick is, but we're living in a time where more men are being more vocal about their feelings, which many women have said they have wanted for a long time. Yes. However, some women are struggling with accepting what men have to say when it comes to them having to accept that all relationship or all problems are not caused by men. This is not meant to be an attack on women, but but many women take it as an attack and they are way more interested in defending women than actually understanding what men are trying to say. It, just, it tends to be more challenging for women to emotionally regulate and to accept accountability, not because they are flawed, but because of the conditioning and training that has taught women that men are less intelligent and more than more. Uh, more than often the problem quality men, which there it is, which there are plenty of, but are, are often overlooked and not talked about are tired of being blamed for everything and are no longer willing to tolerate it. They are, or, excuse me. They want to make it clear that most men are not like the stereotypical B do not like a stereotypical BS that our society teaches about men. It has been challenging because it's difficult for many women to accept because of their personal experiences from choosing and dealing with lesser quality men. By the way, this chick, as red pill as that sounds, not red pill, as far as I know. I don't know how many women are really red pill. But if I say that, or Ryan Stone says that, or anybody in Rule Zero says that, or anybody in the manosphere says that, it's those red pill guys complaining again. The delivery is all that matters. The, uh, the appearance, the perception of that is all that matters. So keep that in mind. And last but not least, I would be remiss. Okay, here's your, here's your parting shot. Here's your shot and chaser moment. Um, where'd it go? That's not her. There it is. There we go. Congratulations. Uh, kudos. Now, there you go. Congrats to Top G. This was funny. That was inspired. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> now, I'm going to show this to you again. But before I do, you've probably heard me say um, on several occasions, like where I'm saying, like, if a woman is with a guy who she doesn't really have any respect for, she's really not sure if he's like the best she can do. She tends not to take his last name. I think I said that on the last show, right? A woman who does not take a man's surname is usually uncertain as to whether or not she wants to take that guy's name to be part of her clan, right? To, to, to be associated with his genetics because a man's name is really the identifier for his, for his DNA. Well, I got into that a few weeks ago. I won't belabor that. So when women are refusing a man's last name as surname, uh, it's usually, well, first of all, it's a sign of disrespect, but it's also more than that. It's also a sign of uncertainty. Like it's all, it's like hedging your bets. Well, I don't want to change my name because I don't know how long I'm going to be with this guy because he's really not the best I can do. And if I can find something in the meantime, then I'm going to you know, do it. I'm go to my plan B. Um, another thing that I've said in the past is that when women have child, have children with men that they are uncertain of who they are not really sure if they really want to have that you know, wanted to, 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 you know, mix their genetics with that guy, they will tend to name their sons in particular, their sons after the guy who made the biggest alpha impact on them. And usually this comes out as being something scandalous because what will happen is like the, 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 um, the, the wife will have the baby of the guy and she'll name the son. Like she will insist on naming the son, like Mike, <laughs> Brock, Brock, the bartender. She'll name him Brock, right? And as a reminder to herself that she would really like, would really, I'm going to turn my son. I mean, maybe this is the lizard brain again, right? Turn my son into the type of man that I couldn't tame in Brock, but I'm going to name him Brock. So he's always this constant reminder that, uh, you know, the, the one that got away, I'm an, it's, it's part of the alpha widow dynamic. 
until like her best friend or her sister is drunk and met, mentions, hey, Brock, isn't that the name of the guy that you used to fuck all the time in college? And then her husband says, oh, my God, you named your, our son after the dude you used to fuck? Like, that's, I mean, it's the ultimate, ultimate fucking disrespect. But there's that, there's that want and there's that desire to want to commemorate in their son, in that child, for a lifetime to remember the name of you know, the, 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 the important men, important man in this case, in her life. So I, off, I, I bring to you once again, say hello to George Waddle Peterson Fuller. Hi, George. Good to meet you. Nice to see you. Glad to, I'm glad. Hey, congratulations on a, a successful pregnancy at 32 years old. And we're really welcoming George into the fold. I hope he hope we can get him into the red pill. I hope he can read my book at some point. George, we really love you. Thanks for coming into the world. Much appreciated. <laughs> I'll let you figure out the joke. <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, let's see. What else do I have? Anybody left? I think that's it. <laughs> Why is the preface always needed to say uh, needed to not to say women are the problem? How you would like would you like to know? I'll tell you exactly why. Because we find that anything that is unfl an unflattering empirical truth about women is something that always has to be counterbalanced by saying something about men. Ooh ooh, men do it too, and they do it worse. Just like exa almost exactly what happened with Molina and um, and uh, Destiny in that whatever clip that I just showed. Oh, but men cheat them the most. Mm, what demographic are we talking about? Because I can show you the stats for 18 to 24, 18 to 29, where women are actually at or above cheating levels of men. Aggregate wise. Yeah. If you're talking about different like generation, sure. Overall, but not in that demographic. But we have to point this out because we can't have anything go against the feminine imperative. We can't have anything go against the little ladies. It's what's called the women. There's literally, this, I'm not making, I'm pulling this out of my ass. Look this up because I can't do it right now. Look this up. There is a psycholo socio psychological uh, dynamic phenomenon. It's called the women are wonderful phenomenon, meaning that anything that, uh, that could be said bad about women, that even if it's true, it always has to be counterbalanced or always, always has to be like, we got to find some way to nerf it, to, 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 to soften the blow. And women will do this by default, right? If I go and I say something, a fact like, well, here's, here's a, here's an empirical fact about women's nature. I can guarantee you that within the first dozen comments on it, I will have at least six of them from women who are saying as a woman, I'm going to tell you why not all women are like that. Or, you will have them say something to the effect of, well, that might be true, but what about men? And my response to that is always, we're talking about women. What about it? Who cares? That's immaterial to the conversation we're having. If, if we wanted to have start another thread, if I was wanted to talk about men, I would talk about how men are dogs and here's how it is. And you know what? No one would respond with, well, women do it too. No one would respond with it because that dynamic, the women are wonderful phenomenon. And it is a thing. Look at Google it. Google women are wonderful. It's a, uh, it's a psychological dynamic. We tend to think of studies that, uh, that appreciate women more. We think of them as being more valid. And I've got, again, I've, there's actually studies and research. Well, thank you, Rolf Degen for this. We tend to look at data that is flattering to women as more, uh, more valid, more, uh, more trustworthy. I think is what it, what it was. I think that's the, what he, the words he used. Because we don't, because again, it's the protector dynamic for women. Like if you, if just the very fact, if I'm to say something like, well, did you know that? What is it? Uh, by the way, uh, it, damn it, Davrick, you got it wrong. But like, if I go and I quote the, um, what is it? The, uh, the rise of the she economy uh, data. And I say, you know, women uh, between the ages of 25 and whatever are going to be uh, single by the end of 2030, I believe it was what it was. And I, I quote that data right there. That's from the Morgan Stanley rise of the she economy, which nobody quotes and nobody cites. If I point that out, then suddenly everyone throws something back at me like, well, you know, um, 
well, uh, you know, men, it's because of men. So it's, they'll find some way to blunt that empirical truth because it goes back to the protector dynamic. You have to take the bullet for the woman. Really, it's what it boils down to, like, like systematically or like evolutionarily speaking. One more, one more for Ned's hero, Bill, and shout out to Big Mo. Yeah. Oh, is Big Mo in there? Where's Big Mo? Tell these bitches to go to hell. Uh, and the FNF Discord, we use your work to help more and more men every day. Thank you for doing that. We got to keep it underground. FNF is the Matrix, and we are the Nebuchadnezzar. Yes. Bring the ship up to broadcast depth. We're going in. <laughs> Somebody got the joke. Uh, I dislike that uh, she gave both names to the kids. Yeah. She is also still technically Michaela Peterson, even even though she wants to say she's a fuller. She's still right. It's like, you know, it's, it's funny. It's like, it's almost like when, when women leave porn and they still use their porn name. If you hate porn that much, why don't you go back to your like real name? <laughs> because nobody would care. Nobody knows who you are. All right, time to get going. I have just got an alert. My dogs are hungry and I have to go downstairs. So there is that. Oh my gosh. Okay, I see Tiffany Fox is also in my, see my good friend, Tiffany Fox is in my DMs right now too. Uh, Rip husbands, women are wonderful in divorce court. Yeah, <laughs> maybe that's a topic I should get into with James Sexton. All right, guys, uh, that's that's it for me, uh, for me today. I sorry, I have to keep doing these uh, these three hour shows or these three ish hour shows uh, because I am the only one in the house who can lift Ned <laughs> all 73 pounds of Ned. Um, and I appreciate everything you guys have done for him, uh, myself included. Uh, and uh, I will let you know, uh, keep you guys updated. He, oh, by the way, he last Monday, he got his wound debrided, or debrided, whatever it is. It's where they clean it out, right? He still has, it's like right on, like right on his arm. It's where, it's at the point of the break where they had to put the, they had to insert the metal, uh, the metal steel tab or whatever it is, the, 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 the rod. And you can still kind of see tendons there. It's, it's kind of grisly, you know. It's kind of, wait, here, here. This is for Ned. Oh, no. Yeah. So, uh, but it's looking better. It's come in, like the our surgeon says, it's come in about a third. And it's not quite to the point where she can like sew it back up together. But it's working its way back in. It's still kind of like, I forget what, there's a name for it where it like, it like works itself back together. So she's, hopefully this week, maybe, I don't know, maybe by the end of the month, they'll be able to sew him back up and he'll be back, he'll be back at least into his Ned is my greyhound. Thank you very much. Would you like to see a picture of Ned? Um, as soon as I can have him here and get the Ned cam in, I'm going to do the Ned cam again. So anyways, uh, he's doing good. Thank you very much for, for all your help and all your, your well wishes and for all your donations, by the way, too, if you want to donate anything, uh, you can always find my Patreon, my crypto, uh, my PayPal, everything else is in the, in the, uh, in the links uh, down below the fold. Also, if you want to join man of men of action, uh, you, you can use my link there. And by the way, if you haven't read The Rational Mail, why not? Um, please go pick up my books. It's the holiday season. Go pick it up for your friends too. Uh, only available on Amazon. You know where to go get it. And if you don't, you can also find the link right down there. So go ahead and check that out. And I'm also writing on Substack now semi-regularly, at least like once every once every week, I'd say. So go check my new Substack out. I got some new ideas and I'm, I'm getting to things in a little bit more detail. Maybe I'm a little bit more coherent when I'm writing. So, um, so please do that. If you want to become a member, you can be a free member. You can get the paid membership. It's not even that much. So, uh, so please join Substack. It's the, the last link or the third link down there. You can check that out. Uh, and then Wednesday, I will be coming back and doing, I think I'm going to do some short form shows. I might do something with Tiffany Fox next. Um, we're going to, we're going to be talking about her leaving porn. So I think I'm going to have her on my show. I've also got some other upcoming appearances. They're going to be me being remote, of course, but I'll let you guys know, uh, as those things materialize, follow me on Twitter. I am Rola Tomasi at rational mail on Twitter. I'm also on Instagram, which by the way, you can now stream from StreamYard to Instagram. So I'm, I'll probably on the next stream, I will probably end up doing that because I really want to figure that out. Um, so I'll probably be doing simulcasts to my Instagram as well. And, uh, and by the way, Access Vegas, Access Vegas, we're just on holiday schedule right now. We're on holiday hiatus. We'll be coming back in January. Uh, most likely the first week of January, we're going to pick up Access Vegas down in Vegas again. Again, everything I've been doing with Ned and just the the fact that well Sticky Paws uh, the studio is closed from like the December 22nd to the 3rd anyway so we just said you know it would take some downtime and um so we will be back and hitting it hard once again in January with Access Vegas we got some new a new lineup we got new people that we're going to interview uh and uh we got uh, we're 
I'm still trying to get it to the point where we can do it weekly. So Thursday, it's usually Thursdays, uh, eight o'clock uh, Pacific time, eleven o'clock Eastern time. But we're still we'll be coming back from that. If you haven't uh, if you haven't subscribed to the Access Vegas channel, you can also do that down there below the fold. Okay, guys, thank you very much. I love you all alike, brothers and sisters. And I am going to be out of here now. <laughs>